Morning. Hi, there. Hi, good morning. Is Lisa not joining us today? She is not. Oh, okay. I am just finding out now, apparently Lisa is not joining us. Okay. And uh, Sabrina, Sabrina is of course joining us, but she is doing so from her home office. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay. So we have a minute or so. No, this is our full complement. We're ready to go in. Uh, when you guys give me the word, we'll go. Okay. Good morning. During the declared emergency in the City of Toronto, Committee of Adjustment virtual public hearings are being conducted by electronic means through WebEx, an online digital platform, and streamed on the Toronto City Planning YouTube channel. These measures are necessary to comply with physical distancing requirements and a provincial order that still limits attendance at public gatherings. My name is Bruce Mullock. Panel members this morning are Nimrod Salomon, Aaron Cheng, and Joanne Hayes. This will be a virtual public hearing. Participants who have registered in advance will be able to make their presentations to the committee using WebEx. Anyone, this will be moderated by city staff. Anyone wishing to view the hearing may do so by watching on YouTube. Participants who have registered in advance will be connecting either by computer, phone, or tablet. All participants will automatically be muted upon entry. When his or her item is called, each participant will be unmuted by the moderator, one person at a time. Only the committee members will be participating by video. Registered participant speakers will be participating by audio only. We ask that you also mute your devices until you are called on to speak. We acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations. Inuit and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. In accordance with sections 45 and 53 of the Planning Act, 1990 is amended. This meeting of the Committee of Adjustment of the City of Toronto is called to order. The Committee of Adjustment considers applications for variations from the provisions of the zoning bylaw which apply to property, permission to extend or alter lawful nonconforming uses, and consents 
to sever property in order to create new lots. Anyone in attendance today who wishes to receive a copy of the decision of the committee on a particular application must submit a written request for a decision by email. Please ensure that you include your name, address, and email address because Committee of Adjustment and TLAB will be sending notifications and appeal updates by email only. You may not agree with the decision of the committee. Decisions may be appealed to the Lo Toronto Local Appeal Body, TLAB, or in some limited circumstances to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Appeal instructions are set out at the bottom of the decision of the committee. Procedure. I will call each item in the order that it is listed on the agenda. When an application is uncontested, the agent or applicant may proceed with their presentation if requested by the committee. The committee may ask questions and or take the matter into committee for a decision. Each speaker including the applicant or agent, will be given a maximum of five minutes to address the committee. And I, I will comment to you when you are reaching the five-minute mark. When addressing the committee, please clearly state your name and address, and please remember to confine your remarks to the matters outlined in the application. The applicant or agent will then Proceed first and may be asked to make a presentation to the committee. Please note that the committee may not entertain revisions to proposals at the hearing today. The committee may decide to defer the application, if substantially revised, in order to ensure that the revised application is accurate and that all those entitled to notice of the application are informed of the changes. Then individuals, either in support of or opposed to the application, will be invited to speak. Committee members may ask questions of each speaker after the speaker has finished their presentation. When all speakers are finished, the applicant or agent will have an opportunity to rebut, but only those issues that were raised by the speakers. And that will mark the end of discussion. The application will then be taken into committee for a decision. Madam Deputy, Secretary Treasurer, have the minutes been confirmed by members? Through you, Mr. Chair, March 23rd hearing. Uh, the minutes are ready for that hearing. Thank you very much. Okay, then I'll look to uh, the panel members for a motion to confirm those minutes. Ms. Hayes, is there a second? It is seconded, Mr. Solomon. So moved and seconded to approve the minutes from March 23. Those in favor, show of hands, please. And that motion is carried by unanimous vote. Madam Deputy, Secretary Treasurer, have you received any requests for deferral? Uh, on items this morning. Through you, Mr. Chair, item number 11, 173 Chaplin Crescent. There is a request to defer. However, the agent is currently presenting an application with panel A. So we'll just wait to deal with that item when it comes up. That'll be fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now, I'll have just a question to panel and staff. Are there any declarations of interest by panel or staff? Hearing none. Let me ask uh, this question. Madam Deputy Secretary Treasurer, are there any files to be closed on this morning's agenda? Through you, Mr. Chair, no, not this morning. Thank you. Okay. With that, we move to our morning agenda. And on the first application, we are dealing with 282 Arlington Avenue. The materials which the committee 
has before it are the following. Committee of Plan of Survey, Site Plan, Floor Plans, Elevations, those, those materials submitted by the applicant. There's a cover letter from the applicant from November. There are state, site statistics from the applicant received November. And there is a commenting report from Urban Forestry received March 23. Moderator, do we have one person standing by to speak on this uh, in opposition? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the applicant is not in the attendance, uh, so I'm currently trying to give her a call. Okay. Um, but it doesn't seem to uh, go through. Let's just put that one to the side then, and we'll, we'll come back to it as you continue to make contact. That That's the agent or the applicant that you're trying to contact. Okay. So we'll just set that aside. And return to it. Application number two. Deals with 42 Deuce and Street. On this application, committee has before it submitted materials, cover letter from Acadia Design. February. Cover letter from the agent, March 23rd. We have email correspondence from City Planning. There are two letters from Toronto Building regarding the legal non-conforming use. And there is a staff report from Community Planning, dated March 22. We have a letter from Councillor uh, and a bylaw recommending conditional approval. And there is support correspondence from 27 Delaware, 86 Dusen, 121 Concord, 105 Concord, 42 C Dusen. There is opposition correspondence. In total, 34 correspondences from the owners of 70 Concord and 110 Concord, 86, 30 Deucen, 94 Gladstone, 98 Gladstone, 84 Concord, 46 and 69 Deucen, 78, 91, 98, 108, 168, and 200 Concord, 28, 36, 43, 44 and 71 Dusen, also from in opposition, 78, 85, 92, 94, 102, 103, and 120 Concord. From 101 Gladstone, from 231 Fort York Boulevard, from 18 Beaconsfield, 14 Stonehouse, and received quite recently from 42 C. Dusen and 44 Dusen. Plus there are 28 form letters in opposition, signed by owners and occupants at 26, 32, 43, 50 Dusen, 62 Delaware, 74, 81, 84, 89, 173, 175, 192, 196, 197, 198, and 199 Concord, and 556, 560, and 562 Ossington. And there's one form letter in opposition from 50 Dusen. So, okay then. Moderator, do we have the agent with us? Yeah, uh, Mr. Flett, you've been uh, unmuted. Good morning. Good morning to you. My name is Ian. Uh, may I begin, or would you like a moment, uh, Mr. Just, Chair? Uh, yes, you, you have five minutes to... Uh, I'll just Let me check with the moderator here. Yes, you'll, you'll have five minutes. We do ask you to make a presentation on your application, and your five minutes begin now. Please go ahead. 
Thank you, sir, and thank you, uh, committee members. My name is Ian Flett, and I'm the lawyer for 42 Deucin Incorporated, which is the applicant in respect of this matter. If you've read over some of the uh, correspondence, you will have noted that this is a little different from what the Committee of Adjustment very often hears because we're seeking permissions pursuant to Section 45.2 of the Planning Act. And so not minor variances, but this is uh, to effectively seek further uses at 42 Doosan uh, beyond what is already permitted as part of their legal non-conforming use uh, at that site. The current legal non-conforming use is for a small retail grocery store. And in effect, what 42 Deuce and Incorporated would like to permit its tenant to do is to install an espresso machine and an oven to serve coffee drinks like espressos and cappuccinos uh, and uh, croissants and the things that are quite popular uh, in Toronto to those who are coming to the store. Um, as you know, under Section 45.2, we need to establish for you that there are uh, legal non-conforming uses already on the site and, uh, and that this is a similar use to what is currently, uh, what is the current use. The legal non-conforming use uh, was recognized by the Toronto Building Department. This is not binding on you. You can come to your own determination. But you'll notice that there's a fair degree of um, opposition and a lot of conversation respect to this matter. And I will, will be submitting to you that the two sources of information that provide you with the, the least biased or, or at least the most disinterested views are from Toronto Buildings and Community Planning. And so Toronto Building uh, did ask for the evidence supporting the legal non-conforming use and remains satisfied to this day that there is legal non a legal non-conforming use at the site for a, a small grocery and retail store. Now, we understood um, that uh, one of the requests made of us as the applicant was to frame our request for greater uses within a definition that currently exists in the zoning bylaw. And so that's why you see the words takeout eating establishment. We'd actually worked with different language and it would be my legal submission that we could use different language, but it appeared that staff was most comfortable with us using a definition coming from the zoning bylaw, which is why you see takeout eating establishment as the, uh, as the further permission. But recognizing that it's not the intention in any way for there to be a restaurant or for there to be some, a, a Burger King or a McDonald's or a taco stand there, and that there were concerns about what kind of impacts that could have. We worked with community planning to set up conditions. And those three conditions are that um, the area for this use would be li limited to 20 square meters. That's about 250 square feet, 215 square feet. They, I, I, I looked this up, the average commercial kitchen is a thousand square feet. So this is a very small area of the, uh, of the building that would be allowed, of the first floor that would be allowed for this use. The next one is that there should be no installation of a fryer, a smoker, or a grill, or similar equipment. And this gives bylaw officers the discretion to say, here's, here's the equipment that will cause uh, negative impacts and they are not allowed at this property. And finally, to limit the hours of operation between seven and nine. I'll also say that there was a candid discussion as to whether or not we might be able to put a condition that would restrict the service of alcohol at the site, recognizing that many people were concerned that there could be a bar there. And we do agree with what came back from the city community planning was that the regulation of the sale of alcohol is a matter for the AGCO and not for the city. And for those of us who have done license appeal tribunal hearings, we've, I, I have noted that there's been a, a consistent threat of the city not to get into the world of enforcing alcohol sales. And that's why you don't see any reference to alcohol in the current zoning bylaw. Um, unfortunately, as I reviewed all of the opponent correspondent, which I take all of it at, at face value, there is a significant misperception that the intention here is for something more than what we are asking for. The opponents are fighting an applicant that is not, uh, and is, are fighting an application that is not before you. This is an application that is highly circumspect and is not a stepping stone to a bigger restaurant or not a stepping stone to a bar. It is simply to be able to serve customers coffee drinks and croissants. If there was any other way to, to firm this up, we would have done it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave ask those you to as make your final comment, please. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll leave those as my submissions uh, for the moment and, and we'll uh, respond to what I hear from, uh, from those who, who may speak after me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go then to our first, our first uh, registered speaker. Um, Mr. Chairman, are, are we able to ask questions now of the uh, agent? If you would like to, yes, you may. Go ahead. Sure. Um, well, I have a few questions. First is, um, is there a reason that the current retail store can't bring in uh, packaged or uh, baked goods already and sell them there? Why do they have to bake them on site? That's a good question, Mr. Solomon. Um, they certainly can uh, do that, and they and they they uh, they currently are selling. So it was interesting. At at one point, there was a discussion with building. What can we do? Currently, members of the public can walk into the store and serve themselves a coffee from a carafe of prepared coffee. Uh, and yes, they 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 could get warmed baked goods uh, from uh, from the site. Uh, and uh, and there's nothing that would prevent that as as a as an option. Um, if the committee recommended the drafting of a, of a condition that would go to that effect, uh, we could work with it. Um, now, I would, on the other hand, recognize that uh, there is popularity in, in freshly baked goods, uh, and uh, freshly baked goods baked on site are not uncommon in the city. Uh, but I do recognize your question and, and the practical implications. And uh, a number of the uh, letters that we have received of uh, opponents have indicated that the applicant in the past has indicated that they were seeking to have a uh, a bar and an outdoor patio is is that the the same app uh, the same owner of the site the owner has been the same since 2018 uh and there's been there have been uh, many miscommunications misunderstandings as to what was sought at this site I, uh, with, with all due respect, I, I believe that the problem was that Boxcar Social uh, was one of the uh, first tenants. And the tenant was solely authorized to open a retail store. Boxcar Social is also well known because it does operate bars in other parts of the city. And so I believe an inference was made by neighbors that Boxcar Social had the intention of ultimately opening a bar. Uh, I would say this about the prospect of opening a bar, and I, and I say this as a lawyer who's represented uh, community groups against licenses for the sale of alcohol at the License Appeal Tribunal. If there's one uh, bit of case law that comes out of License Appeal Tribunal cases, it's that you will almost never be granted a license across the street from a school. So there is never an intention, and it would be, a, a, I, I think, almost a legal impossibility to obtain a license to sell alcohol. And to be clear, we did entertain with staff the possibility of, um, of putting a condition in that would prevent the sale of alcohol. But as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, staff feel that that's, a, that that's an overlapping jurisdiction. They don't want bylaw officers enforcing liquor sales when the AGCO does it with its enforcement par partners, including TPS and the OPP. Um, Thank you. Sure. Mr. Cheng, your question? Right. Hi. Um, since we have a chance to ask question now, I just want to ask you quickly. Um, have you thought about? It's basically following up Nimon's uh, question about uh, selling prepackaged food to, uh, you know, being able to to cook food from scratch. And uh, have you or your client thought about the the waste management? Uh, from my understanding, if you are prepackaging food, there should be much less food waste. Do you have uh, like a waste storage? prepare on the site plan on the drawings that uh, you can identify? No, we have not explicitly uh, dealt with the question of waste. I would indicate that there are storage, uh, there are areas of on the plans that you'll see that are set aside for storage. And so I, I wouldn't have foreseen that, that um, the waste generated from, uh, from the operation of a cafe would have been explicitly problematic. Um, but it, it would be my um, my inference from looking at the plans and, and from an experienced operator like Finch Store uh, that this is something that, that they would not have seen as an issue and something that they would see as easily uh, solved. But thank you for your question. I, and I'm sorry, I can't point you to a specific, um, a specific measure for the waste. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on now. Oh, Mr. Salomon, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Last question. Um, I'm trying to understand how zoning is going to regulate the types of cooking 
equipment in the proposed um, you know establishment and it, it, it to me it's I, I do have some issues of how is this going to be regulated and mon monitored that there be no no types of certain kinds of um, baking or cooking equipment mm -hmm. no I, I understand that so first I, just as a reminder that these conditions are brought to you jointly between ourselves and community planning and having considered and discussed them uh, the idea was to identify equipment that is known to cause and, and throughout the city is recognized to cause problems uh, and impacts within a neighborhood. So very often we do hear complaints in respect of smokers. We hear complaints in, in respect of fryers and, and grilling equipment where you have those large high capacity vents carrying the, um, uh, the smoke, carrying the heat out uh, into, into the, let's say the public air, the air in the neighborhood. Um, those same complaints uh, we we can't uh, are not uh, are not generated when it comes to baked goods, and so we were comfortable uh, identifying the opportunity for baked goods to be there, and of course warming prepared goods. Um, I would say, uh, uh, Mr. Solomon, is that it, it, if if it if it is something, and I have discussed this with my client, if it is something that would help uh, assuage the committee's concern, we could look at amending variance two, or I'm sorry, condition two, to um, uh, to just provide, provide for the warming of prepared goods, uh, if that seems to be something that would uh, get us over the hump uh, for the committee. But, I, but my sense is that we really were trying to target those where, you know, the, the big highlight cases where we hear about okay. issues uh, where the smokers, the grills, the fryers yeah. are causing problems. And the similar equipment also allows for a zoning bylaw officer the, um, the interpretation, right, and the discretion to say this other piece of equipment is like those others and okay. also prohibited. Okay, I'd like to move on now. We have, uh, we have five or six um, speakers registered standing by. So let's go to the first speaker who is standing by, please, moderator. Uh, Farah, you've been unmuted uh, on your cell phone. Good morning. If you'd join us, please, by stating your name. Farah, maybe you can try to unmute yourself on your own uh, device or... Uh... Can you hear me now? Now we do. Yeah, you're loud and okay, clear Okay, great. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Farah Rahman. Um, I am on uh, 70 Concord Avenue. Uh, I'm an architect with uh, extensive background in urban planning. I've been asked to speak on behalf of all the neighbors that are opposed to this change, including myself. Uh, you have uh, probably noted there are 64 letters of objection filed with the committee. The vast majority of neighbors are absolutely opposed to expanding the permitted use of this property. Uh, to that, I would refer you to map of objectors, submission number 29B. <clears throat> In addition to that, our councillor and deputy mayor has also filed an objection. Um, the, I think it was mentioned earlier, she did not say it's a conditional approval. She actually objected, and at the very least, it should be a conditional approval is what she said. I think we should address the elephant in the room. This application is for a takeout restaurant without limit, and that could be any kind of restaurant from pizzeria, subway sandwiches, rotisserie chicken, whatever they choose in the future. This is not an application to add coffee service, sandwiches, and an oven just to warm up few muffins. This service already exists, as you heard earlier from the speaker before me. <clears throat> there is a huge difference between a neighborhood convenience store and a takeout restaurant. A convenience store coexists with the community as this store has done for 70 years. In contrast, a takeout restaurant is an invasion into the community with people from all over, increased traffic into the neighborhood, delivery service, Uber Eats, and so on. This is a residential street and a takeout restaurant is not compatible with it. 
There is also no need to make this permanent zoning change because we all live within close walking distance of hundreds of established restaurants, bars, coffee shops. Community planning has issued a report and, I, and we all believe that we were not properly consulted. We, the community, were not properly consulted. We met with planning on February the 16th and gave a very comprehensive presentation about the adverse impact, especially due to traffic, which is already really bad. A follow-up email was also sent. We did not even receive a courtesy response. We are designated as a neighborhood in the official plan and also mentioned in the community report. The official plan for neighborhood very clearly states in section 4.3 that a new use like this application is only permitted in a neighborhood if, number one, it's on a major road. Dusan is not a major road. Number two, a new use is supposed to go through a zoning amendment, not a committee of adjustment. Number three, they should not adversely you know, affect the neighborhood, which this application does. There is no doubt if there, this change is for a permit, like a takeout restaurant, it will increase traffic, noise, and other things. The more popular the restaurant becomes, greater the traffic. You do the math. Furthermore, we are a residential zone and eating establishments are not permitted. Permitting this change of use will be in violation of our zoning rights. This application should have been declined by the community planning without dragging us all through this emotional roller coaster. The committee mentioned in their report that the counselor arranged a meeting with the developer and residents, but omitted the list of concerns of the residents discussed at this meeting. I shall ask Neither you to make. The committee, I shall ask you to make your final comment now, please. Uh, the committee did not even um, note that the the mayor, uh, deputy mayor, and counselor had objected to this. Um, and the, in discussion of the prior and, and all this, who is going to regulate this? Creating a problem and then trying to solve it is not, a pro not, a, not the way to go. The property is zoned residential and has been for 70 years. The proposed change is a permanent change and cannot be allowed. Your time we laid out is now up. We laid out in detail here today in Your our time correspondence is, is with you up. the reasons why the your time is now up. Thank you. Moderator, let's move along to please. First of all, questions panel for this speaker. Any questions for this speaker? No. Let's move along to the next registered speaker standing by. Uh, John, you've been unmuted on your uh, cell phone. Good morning. Um, Maybe you can try to unmute yourself on your own device. And uh, John Adams, can you hear us? So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I actually tried to call him because he was not in the attendance. Um, okay. I think we might have gone straight to voicemail. So, Let's go to the next speaker then. Eduardo, you've been uh, unmuted. Hi. Uh, my name is Eduardo Di Conca. I live at 102 Concord Avenue. Uh, let's start up half a block from 42 Dusen. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for my opportunity to uh, express my concerns about this proposed change. Um, I've been here for more than 25 years, and it was quite convenient to have the grocery store so close to home. 
And the proposed changes would imply, and I guess there is no doubt, uh, more traffic. By the way, could you please pull up the pictures I sent? Um, also? Just, just hang on a second, Eduardo, and we'll, we'll, we'll put up uh, some sure. materials, materials. Yes, just, just hang on for a moment. It's number 22. Are these the photos you're reviewing? You're referring to? Uh, yeah. yeah. Let me know when. Uh, go ahead. I can continue. Go ahead now. Yeah, okay. Oh. There's the photos, Edward, and now we go ahead, please. Yeah. Could you go to the bottom uh, of the pictures, the last pictures? Thank you. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, takeout uh, establishment will bring more traffic for delivery, for pickup, and also they could probably put some tables and have people come in from outside our community to have lunch, dinner, whatever. And as you can see in these pictures, there is no parking on the north side of Tucson. There is limited parking on the south, south side of Tucson because of the school. South of Tucson on Concord Avenue, limited parking because of the school. Um, that's what is shown in these pictures. Now, if you go up again, please, to the other pictures. Uh, yeah, further up, please. Thank you. Right there. This is Concord Avenue. Uh, the minivan there, that's how we have to park. That minivan is my car. And it's not only once. You can see there are different cars in front and in the rear of my car at different times. If you go further up, you can see many times the state of parking. More cars here would be a disaster. We cannot allow to have any more cars. And a takeout establishment would increase traffic. We cannot uh, put up with that. It's too much. Now, that's uh, one of the problems I have. The other problem is the dishonesty of Mr. Keshu. He uh, put up an affidavit saying that they used to sell coffee at uh, Francesco's, it used to be called, the previous establishment. Yes, they sold ground coffee, but they never brew coffee there. Uh, it's not true that they were selling sandwiches prepared in there. I used to go there, I go by every day, and that's part of the dishonesty. Nobody sold ever sandwiches or coffee to go at that establishment. And the store was closed after Francesco left. And contrary to what Mr. Keshu says on his affidavit, there was no uh, uh, selling of anything until October when he reopened. In that interval, the store was closed, and I used to go by every day. So I know it was closed. It was never open until October. So there are other affidavits saying that they used to sell coffee and bake goods. And I don't want to imply that my neighbors lie. Probably they were mistaken, as I was until recently, thinking that uh, like Christie, the company that provides uh, makes Oreo cookies, those comp that company bakes cookie at their own facility, package, bring them to what used to be San Francisco and sell them. To me, that was baked because the cookies are baked. My understanding now is that baked goods is different according to the city. Um, but uh, that was the only kind of uh, baked goods that was sold, they were in package. I'll ask, I'll ask you now for your final comments, please. I oppose vehemently to this uh, application because Mr. Ashes has been deceiving. Uh, his lacks of honor, integrity, sincerity, 
it's immoral what he wants to do, and that goes against our community. Thank you very much. Panel members, any questions? No. Next speaker, moderator, shall we move along, please? Uh, Ian Andrus, you've been uh, unmuted. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We do hear you. Good, good morning. Great. Hi. Uh, my name is Ian Andres. I'm a lawyer with Goodman's. I'm representing Kenneth Bonner, uh, who owns 44 Deucen directly across the street and who is also very much opposed to this application. Uh, I want to start with a few legal points. The first point is that the applicant has not met the statutory prerequisites for the committee to consider and approve this application. This is not a minor variance application. It's an application for additional non-conforming uses under 45.2A2 of the Planning Act. And it's a very broad and vaguely defined uh, set of uses being sought. In order to attain approval under this subsection, the applicant must conclusively demonstrate that the subject property benefited from a legal non-conforming use, and this is important, that continued until the date of the application. Those words are in the legislation. The applicant must also demonstrate the proposed new uses are either similar to the purpose for which the building was used when the bylaw prohibition first take of, took effect in the 50s, or more compatible with the uses that are currently permitted in the bylaw than the purpose for which the building was used in the 50s. In this case, the applicant has failed all of these tests. We accept that a legal non-conforming use previously existed, but it was forever lost due to being discontinued for a very long period of time, and the current use, frankly, is unlawful. Our client has filed extensive sworn evidence with supporting documentation confirming there was no convenience store, no small corner store or grocery store on the property between January 2018 and October 2021, which is nearly four full years and more than two full years before the pandemic occurred. There's also extensive evidence that the current owner has showed no intention to continue the previous legal non-conforming use throughout this time until the, re the store recently opened in October 2021, three and a half years after the previous use was abandoned. And in response to what my friend Mr. Flett said, this is not misapprehension or speculation in any way. The source of all of this information is the applicant itself. The applicant filed numerous uh, real estate listings through MLS in which he advertised the property as an ideal location for a bar or restaurant with a patio. The applicant also uh, entered into a lease with Boxcar Social, as my friend indicated, who publicly declared through flyers its intention to open a bar and seek a liquor license at this location. So the applicant only has himself to blame for what Mr. Flat, his lawyer, is now calling misapprehension and misunderstanding. All of this information came from the applicant. There's no question that there was no store operating on this property on March 17, 2021, which is the date the application is made and the only relevant date for the purposes of subsection 452A2. The legal non-conforming use had been abandoned at that date and was forever lost. And just ask yourself logically, with no actual use on the property on that date, how can the applicant argue an intention to continue a use that was not operating while at the same time actively applying to pursue a different use? Those two things are irreconcilable and it doesn't make any sense. Moreover, the proposed new takeout eating establishment use is not at all similar to the grocery store that was operating in the 50s when the zoning first prohibited the use. At that time, there was no food or beverages prepared on the site. It sold small confectionery items. And the proposed uses now have a much higher intensity and impact as some of the other speakers have spoken to. It's also not more compatible with the uses permitted in the bylaw, which are all strictly residential uses. An eating establishment use cannot be more compatible with residential uses when it is strictly prohibited. And even small retail stores are prohibited in this area, although contemplated in some other parts of the R zone. So there's no question that eating establishment uses are not more compatible. As a result, there's no statutory basis upon which this application can be approved. And Toronto building staff initially agreed with this position last July. They indicated that the legal non-conforming use had been called into serious question and could no longer be confirmed. And at that time, there was still no convenience store in operation. As you've heard, the applicants submitted some materials which caused building staff to reconsider their position and accept the applicants' claims at face value. But by their own admission, building staff are not capable of determining this issue. They're not adjudicators. They did not have a committee application before them. They didn't even have a building permit application before them. So they don't have the tools to assess, assess the credibility or veracity of the materials filed by the applicant. And even if they did, the application still fails the statutory prerequisites for the reasons stated. Uh, 
As indicated in my friend's written submission, the four tests for assessing a minor variance application do not apply, so I'm not going to speak about those here. Um, but I would also point out that in my friend's written submission, he does cite a case which uh, purports to provide legal tests under Section 45.2 of the Planning Act. But that case is irrelevant because it dealt with an enlargement or expansion of a building, which I'll is not the final comment period. now, please. Okay, the final comment is that the planning report is also misguided. It does not address the uh, correct portion of the official plan policy. And it's true that Councillor Bailao is opposed to this application. Her letter clearly states that. My client agrees with that. The conditions are not sufficient. And I would respectfully urge you to uh, reject this application based both on its lack of statutory jurisdiction and its lack of planning merit. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions panel, there's a question from Mr. Salomon. So uh, I'm trying to understand then if you believe that th they don't fit under that particular section of the Planning Act, what do you see then, what are you asking then the committee to decide or to, to, or to do? I, I, I'm not sure I understand that. I'm asking the committee, thank you for your question, Mr. Solomon. I'm, I'm asking the committee to reject this application because the applicant does not meet the statutory prerequisite to even apply under that subsection because there was no legal non-conforming use continuing on the date of the application. And those words continuing on the date of the application are directly quoted from the Planning Act. So without that prerequisite being met, the committee actually has no jurisdiction to approve the application as it's framed before you. The only way that this applicant could actually seek to have these uses added would be through a full rezoning application that would go through a full public process. And frankly, that's what the official plan contemplates for a change of use of this magnitude. But there's no ability to to do this through 45.2A2 because the tests are not met. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, panel? The speaker, okay, we'll go on. Uh, we have one more speaker on this application registered. Uh, Mr. Simeon, you've been unmuted as well. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me okay? We do hear you. Please state your name. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Lazarus Simeon. I live at 30 Deucin Street. Thank you for uh, taking the time to hear. I'm not going to uh, repeat uh, uh, or reiterate any of the other comments that my, uh, my uh, colleagues and neighbors have uh, already stated, uh, except to say uh, and perhaps to stress the fact that uh, from the very beginning, uh, the uh, owner had stressed or had indicated that this was an ideal location for a, a bar. Uh, they had put placards up on the uh, on the uh, property itself, and I think this is the ultimate goal here. Uh, regardless of what the uh, what the current application says, the ultimate goal here is to change the land use to an extent to allow for the sale of liquor and to turn this into a, like a bona fide restaurant property. Uh, with respect to uh, I'll do respect to Mr. Flett's comments. This this was not inferred. This was uh, overtly stated in the communications that we received from the first tenant who uh, moved into that property or took ownership or whatever uh, residence in that property, uh, that boxcar social. And then, like I said before, in the various uh, advertisements uh, by the owner. So it's not an inference. This was uh, overtly stated that this was going to be the uh, end goal here the uh, of this particular property. And with regards to uh, the uh, the space for the kitchen right now uh, you there are plenty of uh, of uh, establishments and restaurants in the neighborhood or further down on Harvard Street that have that size of a kitchen that work uh, quite well to service a restaurant so it's it's not out of the question you don't need to have a massive kitchen I've worked in restaurants or I've been around restaurants all my life uh, you you can function a restaurant or you know have a functioning restaurant and with that size of a kitchen to uh, it, it it's it's enough and I really don't want to take too much of your time I think uh, the other uh, uh, comments were fairly eloquent and uh, fairly uh, clear and uh, thorough in their opposition to this particular uh, um, proposal uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to hear me and I will uh, just mute myself now thank you any questions for Mr. Simeon panel. Hearing none, it's now time to return. Um, I'll just check with the moderator. Moderator, were we able to raise? Um, there was one speaker here that we couldn't raise. Yeah, it was uh, Mr. John Adams. Uh, no, I haven't been. That's OK. OK. Thanks for trying. All right, then we'll go back now. This will be the opportunity for the, uh, the agent to um, respond to these comments in rebuttal. 
and respond only to the uh, the issues raised. So let's go back now to the agent, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I do want to thank those who took the time out of the day to speak to the committee, uh, notwithstanding it was in opposition. Uh, let me begin just by clarifying one thing that uh, you're hearing the word restaurant uh, over and over. And in this, pay in this uh, case, the definition that we're seeking the further use under is the takeout eating establishment, which contemplates that anything that is, uh, that is purchased is consumed off-site. Uh, in respect of the concern with traffic, and everyone is very concerned with traffic throughout the city, that's understandable. However, uh, it's it's pretty clear, uh, and I would submit to the committee that in reviewing the scope of what is sought here, notwithstanding the attempts of others to characterize it as a, as a great magnitude or a very large change, the scope is simply not one that supports the notion that people will be driving from out of the area to come to this site for coffee and croissants. In fact, another of the uh, writers to the committee indicated the number of other cafes and restaurants that are within walking distance of the area. And it would be my submission to you that those places would be just as easy to serve uh, those coming from out of the area with coffee and croissants if that's what they're looking for. I do want to address uh, head on a number of submissions that you heard from Mr. Andres, uh, who is speaking on behalf of Mr. Bonnard. Um, Mr. Andre said that uh, this site does not benefit from illegal non-conforming use because it was abandoned. Uh, Mr. Andres did not point you to the case law that clearly, clearly indicates that where there's an intention to continue use, uh, that that is sufficient to maintain the use. And throughout the period when the store was not operating, there was absolutely an intention to carry on that use. In fact, there were building permits that were authorized by the uh, building department uh, to permit for uh, improvements to the property in order to pursue the retail use. And so unfortunately that submission falls flat once you have that, um, once you have that in front of you. Uh, it, 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 I, my, my only other uh, comment uh, is, is that in, in this respect, uh, this is not a question of the official plan and how it applies. This is a legal non-conforming use that the committee uh, has been asked to, to approve uh, a similar additional use. And uh, in effect, what we're saying is that there's not a big difference between coming to, uh, coming to this location to get an espresso in addition to anything that you would otherwise buy in a small retail or grocery store. Uh, I'll leave those submissions uh, there. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the members of the committee. Any further questions, panel members, for the... Mr. Cheng, go ahead. Yes, just for my information and uh, for the record, could you uh, be a little bit more specific about uh, the date of the building permit that you applied in order to justify that this is still a non-conforming use? Uh, yes, Mr. Chang, I can, but I'm going to need to ask you for one or two minutes to bring to bring that up. That's not something that I have uh, at, at the tip of my... Uh, uh, just for the record, so we know that you know what you said is accurate right sure give me just uh, so I, I will just need a minute because I'll have to bring that up just a moment please And while we are waiting for him to show us the, the date, let's say what he said is correct. Can we get some technical support from the staff confirming that, uh, you know, the, the, the building permit does uh, have an implication that the legal not confirming is not expired? So, uh, Mr. Cheng, just to give you some context, and I'm the, the quickest way to, to provide you with the information is in reference to a correspondence uh, with a council for the city of Toronto. Um, and this was, and so, so you've heard, and, and since you've asked, we'll, we'll now get into a little bit of this. Uh, the building staff in September of uh, 2020 did find that there was, um, that there was a legal non-conforming use at the site and recognized it as such. 
Uh, and then th there were there was evidence that was submitted by a number of opponents uh, that brought some of Mr. Kashev's statements into question. We responded to those in a very uh, firm letter uh, because the allegation was that Mr. Kashev was not being transparent. And in that letter, um, it, it provided, and remember this is buildings which would also have been uh, doing the building permit mm -hmm. uh, application. To provide some context, you will recall Mr. Kashev's affidavit that he took on renovations at 42 Dusen Street to accommodate retail use. The period of that, those renovations began in the late summer of 2020, including the issuance of building permits in mid-October, the closing of permits in January of 2021, followed by ongoing non-permit work until summer of 2021. All this work was conducted during lockdowns and the dearth of available labor and supplies. Uh, so, the, so the principal dates in respect of uh, those applications uh, would have been in the summer of, of 2020 when the re renovations began. So probably spring of 2020 is when the applications for the building permits would have been made. And so building staff in considering those applications for building permits would have been alive to the question of whether there was a legal non-conforming use there. Okay. okay. Um, Mr. Chang, do you still want to have staff, uh, you, you ask staff to comment on something? Do you want to go to staff now for a comment? It would be good just to confirm. I mean, I, I'm not very legally informed with this. I'm just trusting the applicant's uh, information. Let's, um, Madam Deputy Secretary Treasurer. Mm -hmm. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm not in a, a position to confirm all of that. We we don't have all of the documents from the building division, so um, I, I can't confirm what has been stated. Okay. Okay. Let's go to Ms. Hayes, who has a question, I think, for the agent. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I have a question with respect to, um, you know, it talk, you're looking for an extension of a use for a takeout eating establishment because planning staff have said that is the definition. I have heard the submissions and have reviewed all the materials with respect to the conditions that have been discussed with planning and and your your client and, and possibly yourself with respect to how to confine that. Um, one of my issues is I've, I've heard your submissions that the intent is only to do baked goods and sell espressos, but there's nothing in these conditions that talk about you know like say you you um, you know to some of the uh, residents' concerns that. You couldn't sell salads and prepared sandwiches, things that don't need ovens or fryers or grills or, or things like that. And so I, I'm, I'd just like to hear your submissions about, you know, some of the concerns with respect to the extent of of the permission being requested, um, and the and the conditions that are being suggested that should alleviate those concerns. Well, thank you very much for your question, Ms. Hayes. Where I would begin is, is you've probably had an opportunity to review in our submission photographs of the store. And if you haven't already had the opportunity to visit the site and the store that's currently there, you would see that there are a number of prepared foods that are all ready for sale for consumption off-site at the retail location. So you can go there today and, and lawfully uh, buy soup, uh, you can. I, I, there may very well be prepared sandwiches. I, I, I'm not sure. I haven't seen it in, in a couple of weeks. But you could pull out of a fridge a sandwich, a salad, a soup. All these things uh, would be you could get right now. Uh, so it's our submission that 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 is actually not the that's not the feature that is causing the problem in respect of how many of the opponents and the concerns of the opponents. I, to be perfectly honest with you, I believe the, the central concern of the opponents, and I put myself as much as I can into their shoes, is that the words take out eating establishment cannot but raise the vision of something more than just a cafe. And had we been able to define the use to something as specific as an espresso machine and a warming oven, uh, that's really what we would have liked to have done. Uh, but but we, we were asked to use this definition coming from the zoning bylaw. And, and so what we've tried to do is reverse engineer it to, 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 to create those restrictions so that you're not going to have the major, um, the, the significant impacts. Um, I, I, in terms of whether the, there, would, there would be sandwiches in addition to baked goods, I, because those are already sold on site and already lawfully sold on site, for consumption off-site. Um, I, I don't think that that's really where the crux of, of the dispute of the dispute is. Okay. 
If there are no further questions for the applicant, let's take this application into committee for a uh, for a motion. And unless there is, so we're, we're going to go take it into committee now. And uh, I'll look to panel members for any comments say if, if they want to make a comment before we move to a motion. And any comments, panel? Mr. Chen, go ahead. Yes, I just want to add that if uh, if we are going to approve the this application based on the information we have, we should restrict or put in the condition that there should be no commercial kitchen allowed. So when the package passed to the building department, there will be no, you know, the fire department and the building department mechanical review, they will make sure that there's a restriction on the kitchen of the foot prep area. So in that case, many of those concerns that the neighbors have brought up will be, will basically be illegal to have. Okay. I, I am my my experience dealing with the building department and the building co is there is a system there that can restrict what kind of food to be made. That you will have you will need a grease trap. You will need a lot of things to to make that kind of restaurant or takeout restaurant happen. If you are going to apply for a permit, of course, right. So, I think from from my point of view, I have no issue with the expansion of the food they're going to provide to a point that it shouldn't be uh, creating all those uh, uh, waste and all those uh, issues that the neighbors have brought up. So I think if we can tie that condition, uh, I think the system can protect the neighbors. Other comments? Ms. Hayes. Um, I have a bit of a differing view. I think in looking at evaluating this application, I'm not convinced of uh, that the impact that the it's similar use to the original use in the in the context that was present before other than there's a coffee and a muffin but the um i i think it's an expansion that i don't think is um does not come without out adverse impacts and i can't support the application as i don't believe that we could satisfactorily put into place conditions that would um, have the constraint that was necessary. And that's my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Salomon. Yeah, I would have to agree with those comments. Um, the applicant has indicated that they currently sell coffee. They currently sell baked goods. They also sell salads and but they indicate that their proposal is to really only sell, um, make baked goods and coffee there, but they're already doing that now. And so I, it raises in my mind, really, what is it that they're actually looking to do? And in my view, what they're looking to do is to expand the uh, use to uh, beyond what is currently there now. And I don't believe it is similar then to what to a retail store, and I believe then that the impacts um, of that um, would not be uh, appropriate. So I, I cannot support the application. Thank you, and um, to offer my comment, um, I am persuaded by the the written submissions and by the verbal submissions this morning that this is not desirable. So I won't be able to support it either. So I do look to panel for a motion on the application, please. Ms. Hayes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, for the reasons that have been noted and the, the evaluation criteria that we have to apply to applications um, under 45.2, um, I would move a motion to refuse the application. Is there a second to that motion? It is seconded by Mr. Salomon. So moved and seconded to refuse the application. Those in favor of that motion, show of hands, please. Those opposed. So the motion is carried by a vote of three to one. Let the record show that Mr. Cheng was in dissent. And with that, the panel moves along to item number three. Or do we think we have number one on? OK, I, I'm going to reverse a little bit then. We did set aside number one. We're going to go back now to item number one, which was set aside. And um, we'll 
return to that one and have the or the agent for that one join us, please. Hello. Hello, good morning. Yeah, good morning, sir. My name is Jose Romero. I am the uh, represent my client for the 282 Arlington Avenue. Thank you. Just stand by for a moment while I remind okay. the public what the panel has before it in the way of materials. On this application, before us are the submitted materials. There's a cover letter from the applicant. There are site statistics from the applicant, November. And there is a forestry uh, report from Urban Forestry. OK, then. On this application, we have no one standing by in opposition. Do we know? So panel members, does anyone wish a presentation on this application? Hearing none, I'll look to panel for a motion, please. Ms. Hayes, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, having reviewed the materials on file, I believe in the context of what other built forms of accessory structures uh, exist in the neighborhood, this is not out of context. And I would like to move a motion to support the application or to approve the application subject to forestry condition number one. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? It is seconded, Mr. Chang. Moved and seconded to approve subject to forestry. All those in favor, show of hands, please. And that is a unanimous vote to approve the application. And with that, the panel moves to item number three, 20 Amsterdam Avenue. On 20 Amsterdam, before us are the submitted materials. There is a staff report from Urban Forestry. And there is opposition in the form of the following correspondence from 15 Amsterdam, 31, 16, 17, 18, 37, and 51 Amsterdam, and also 22 Amsterdam. And there is a 59 signature petition in opposition, received March the 23rd, signed by owners and occupants of, well, there are 59 addresses here. Um, I'm not going to read them all. They are on Amsterdam Avenue in the order of about 25, um, from Westview Boulevard in the order of six, from Holland Avenue, two signatures, and from Galbraith, nine signatures, and one from Yardley Avenue. Okay then, moderator, let's have the agent join us. Uh, Ashwick Sharbara, you've been unmuted. If you can try to unmute yourself uh, on your end. You hear me? Oh. So we can hear you, but barely. So maybe you could try to speak up, and I'm going to uh, try to do it on my end as well. OK. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, way better. Much better. Very good. Please state your name. Okay. So, so we have four variances here. Hello. We go, uh, yes. Uh, would you begin, please, by stating your name? Yeah, sure. Uh, myself, Ashwik Chabra, and I'm the architect for this application. And I want to bring light to the four variances which we have here for 20 Amsterdam. Uh, can you share our presentation? Yes, we shall. Just just uh, hold on for a moment while we bring it up. There we go. Are you referring just to the plans, or had you submitted something, a, a specific presentation? Uh, we uh, uh, submitted a specific application, uh, like a presentation. Just one minute. When did you submit it? Uh, we submitted a day before. Can I? Uh, yeah. This is it. Okay. Yeah. So we have four, currently we have four issues here. 
First is maximum lot coverage, which is like 35% of the lot area required by the city. Second is floor space index. Third is minimum front yard required landscape. And fourth is maximum permitted height. So the first one, we are achieving 37.43% of the lot area right now with our application. And we are allowed up to 35%. But we already have some applications which are approved by the city, which goes almost more than 40%. So we have also added our evidence in this presentation. So that's why, and the another reason is, we have like maximum houses we have there so we have like the garage in the backyard so they have the house lot coverage plus the garage lot coverage so with our new proposal we are bringing the garage in the building so that's why our maximum lot coverage is increasing so then coming to second point the fsi FSI got uh, is more than what uh, what stated in the bylaw, but we have some previous cases where the FSI increased than like what was allowed in the bylaw. So, if we can go down more down like. Yeah, can you stop here? Yeah, so we have like some previous decision approved, approved in the neighborhood where we have like maximum lot coverage increasing up to 43% for 86 Amsterdam, then 91 Amsterdam have 40% of the total area. Similarly, 105 Amsterdam have 38% of the total area. Like these are more than what we proposed and has been already approved in the past. Same with the FSI, it has been approved in the neighborhood in the past, and it was more than what we are uh, trying to get it. Then the minimum front yard required landscape, similar thing with that. Like for 86 Amsterdam, it got approved for 41%, and for 91 Amsterdam was 55%, and similar cases was present there. Then uh, the last one is maximum permitted height of all exteriors, all side exterior main wall is seven meter. So we have a previous case with 91 Amsterdam where the, we got an approval for 8.6 meter height for the main walls. So I want to bring light uh, to this for all the committee members. Like uh, we want to build a house and uh, we are building as per our client requirement and uh, we are trying to be within the bylaws. So yeah, like I want to say that, that's it for me. That's it for you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, panel. Questions at this stage, or shall we go to the speakers? Let's go to the speakers then. Moderator, let's have the first speaker join us, please. Um, so through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the first, Randit Somis, the first speaker, will not be speaking. Okay. So we can go uh, to John Keeble. Let's do that. Okay. John, you've been unmuted. Uh, yes, uh, good morning. My name is uh, John Keeble and I live at uh, 51 Amsterdam Avenue. I've lived here for over uh, 50 years and just so you know, i have born and raised in East York in this community since 1949 and lived on five streets into the wartime houses. Um, quite frankly, uh, the block of story and a half that flow into the bungalows from Glenburn to Westview we have already had two houses built to the footprint with no problem at all to these houses because the houses line up in flow. We have a consistency in this area that uh, 
it looks natural. We, we realized that the upper part of uh, Amsterdam, yes, was the older part when I was younger that was dysfunctional and it was chopped up. But there's no reason to destroy the flow of the story in halves. With two houses being already built to the footprint, we have a constant history on this street of we've had a movie movie made superhero we've had a sick kids hospital do two commercials one recently last year during covid um the street has a natural history of, of of a community flow so to put in one of the bungalows that what he is requesting with not minor variants these are large variances that will change the whole culture and the look of the whole street and plus, if you give in to if some of the variances, what he is saying, one of them will affect by putting a door on the other neighbor's driveway. That will affect every bungalow in this whole community. It will change the whole community from St. Clair, O'Connor, Victoria Park to Holland Avenue. Every bungalow will be affected by this decision. Um, if you can just take into consideration yes change is constant and we do need to upgrade but these houses have been around since 1950 and they have sustained and that and the story and halves are four bedrooms so i can't see being that i'm born and raised here the need to destroy uh the block for and put an eyesore in just for one person he bought a small lot house and he's asking for large variances that do not fit in and will not line up aesthetically with uh, what's going on here. Plus, there'll be the problem with the soft shoulder and the drainage where we already, he won't have enough room for runoffs. Um, I'm hoping that I realize that every, the whole community has changed, but you have to look at why destroy this block that has a natural Flow. When you go on it and you see it, it has nothing to do with the upper part of Amsterdam or the other areas that are going on. Um, I think he can build something nicely within the bylaws, but variances are there for the simple reason being he wants to change the rules of the, of the building code. I do not see that necessary at all. Um, and being that I'm born and raised here, I can tell you that uh, this will affect your decision here will affect maybe maybe more than 150 bungalows in this whole community if this was given into. Um, thank you for your uh, your time and uh, and and take care. Okay, thank you, John. John, let me begin the questions for you, and then Ms. Hayes, I'll sure. Ms. Hayes next. I just have a question. You mentioned that the, your particular concern about that door on the side. And you you described how, how would the impact be as wide as you're describing? Well, the impact on the door is on the soft shoulder. So if you go through every bungalow in this area from and you go all the way down off of Salwin Avenue, you go to Tiago, you go to especially Galebraith, you look at them all, they all have the same same side as the driveway. So you would affect in effect what was built in the 50s and how these how this was planned out by the builder which was cats because i remember because being i'm born and raised because i actually lived in rooms with my parents at 96 uh, when i was four years old on Amsterdam. if you look at at the soft shoulder on every side it affects every bungalow in the community it's not just it's not a one-off on this street what they're asking for it will change it, it will open the door because if you give set a president, once a president is set, you can't change it as you all know, because that's the way it works. And it will be used for every builder okay. that wants to go after those bungalows once this person is get granted here. Thank you. Uh, well, let's go to Ms. Hayes' question now, followed by sure. any others that are. Ms. Hayes, your question, please. Thanks very much. Um, I noticed there was, I don't know how old the builds are, but new two-story homes at number 26 and number 39. Um, how how do you feel what's before the committee now would okay um I, I, I'm sorry I, I couldn't hear, yes. hear what you yes. okay I, sorry I, I'll, I I'll go again you, you, so, you trailed off 
um, I'll, I'll, so there, there is some new builds. I don't know how new they are at number 26 and number 39. Yes. Um, can you tell me what differing impact or differing considerations you feel this application before the committee um, differs from those builds? Okay, 39 did not need permission because he built exactly to the footprint. So therefore he set the president that he built a house within the means on the platform and the structure of lining up. 26, uh, we had issues with him. He wanted to build, he wanted all kinds of variances and, and, and it, the reality was he didn't get his wish be, and it was for, and he built within the confines of lining up with the variances that were granted, but they were not, they were very, they weren't even, they're very small because he had to build to the footprint too because of what happened at uh, 39 Amsterdam. So the reality is this, this build application has, these uh, variances are, are asking to change everything and the lineup and the, and the culture of the street. It will not flow with the, the street at all. It, the aesthetically, it will look, it will be an eyesore. Thank you, John. And if two and if two builders could build within the means of the footprint and keep the the culture here, which we have the history of the culture we've had with what's been done and, and used for commercials for sick kids and for for the movie industry. Uh, okay, John. Well, that'll be gone. All right, John. We're, we're repeating a bit now, so let's go on. Are there sure. any further questions now for the uh, the speaker? Okay, let me just check. Do we have another speaker standing by, moderator? Yes, we do. Okay then, let's go to the next speaker and thank you to John. Well, uh, Lisa and Adam, I don't know who is going to speak, but you've been uh, unmuted. Okay, uh, this is Lisa, I'm going to be speaking. And if you could bring up, we have um, some pictures in a file called CA Letter of Objection 7B, and it's called late as there are some very minor changes that we made from the previous mission. Lisa, just while we're pulling up it's that material. B. Lisa? Yes, that's um, it. This is the chair. Lisa, just while we're pulling that up, would you mind stating yes. your full name, please? Just for the it's record. Lisa Dimitrick. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'll start now. My name is Lisa Dimitrick, and I live at 22 Amsterdam. Avenue with my spouse. Our property is on the east side of 20 Amsterdam. We, we are concerned about the variances being requested here and we've come to voice our opposition. Chapter 4 of the City of Toronto official plan talks about the broad, broader and immediate context or geographic areas which are to be considered in new proposals. The characteristics of properties that are on the same block and the block opposite of the development are in the immediate context. The plan states that in instances of significant difference between the broader and immediate context, the immediate context will be considered to be of greater importance. As you can see in the first set of pictures, these are the immediate context. The west end of Amsterdam, close to O'Connor, is predominantly bungalows with small 10 meter lots like number 20. The top photo is on the north side and we've labeled 20 Amsterdam. The bungalows are also directly across the street in the second photo. If you could go to the next page, please. You can see in the next page that the story and a half homes carry on eastward from the bungalows. Oh, I'm not sure why that's showing. That's not our photo. That's our photo number three, actually. Um, there's supposed to be a small map uh, with some outlines. It might be just above the page. Sorry. This, this isn't it, um, is it? Uh, so I wanted to say that there is a picture um, with story and a half bungalows which carry on eastward, and I'm not sure whose <laughs> documentation this is, but um, this, those uh, story and a half homes have wider lots than the bungalows, and bef just below that there is a map that outlines where the bungalows are in blue and the story and a halves are in light pink, and oh, that's the photo right there, thank you. And you can see how hom homogenous this immediate context is to our street. 
our block of Amsterdam is completely different from the block that is Glenburn to Victoria Park. And based on information submitted by the city on another development, we were able to view the frontages of all the properties on Amsterdam. And 92% of the properties on our block have frontages of, nine, of 10 to 15 meters. But in contrast, 38% of the properties between Glenburn and Victoria Park are within this range. So 92 to 38%. 32% of the properties on that end of the block have properties that are less than 7.6 meters, but there are no properties like that on our block. This development will have a high flat roof and it looks like a three-story house. As you can see in the photos, that style will look completely out of place being surrounded by houses with peaked roofs and no front or back balconies. Um, if you could go to our slide number three, hopefully you can find it. We have a privacy concern with the balconies too, especially with the back one as it will look right onto our backyard. And the raised rear deck will look directly over into our backyard. The mass, height, and bulk of the proposed development will create issues related to loss of sunlight, privacy, drainage, spacing, and openness to us and our surrounding neighbors. According to the city, the front yard landscape will only be 43%, much less than the required 75%. In contrast, we went out and calculated that our yard, which is typical to the area, is well above that bylaw. Mr. Afroz said that the proposed lot coverage meets the general intent and purpose of, his, of the zoning bylaws in his uh, case, but that's not true. 96% of the houses in our block are well under the bylaws. As an example, a bungalow without a detached garage has a lot coverage of about 26% and an FSI of 0.26. This proposal exceeds that at 36% and 0.71 for the FSI. Going above the bylaws is a significant change and not at all minor. The other two houses, or 4% of the street, have been recently developed and were both built within the bylaws. The most recent build went to the Committee of Adjustment with a lot coverage of 37% and an FSI of 0.67. That request was refused. The application that is before you now exceeds both of those. Mr. I'll ask now, summary. I'll ask now for your final um, comment, please. The official plan notes that the development is intended to be sensitive and gradual with little visible change so that the character of the neighborhood can remain intact. This application does not respect nor does it reinforce the existing character or stability of our neighborhood. These variances, especially when taken in consideration with the existing houses in the immediate area, are not minor, and we respectfully request that you refuse this application. Thank I you also very want much. to note Your that all... Your time is up. Your time is up. Thank you. Questions for this speaker panel? No. Okay, then, I believe that is the last registered speaker in opposition. Okay, then, it is now time to return to the agent who will have a chance to offer comments and rebuttal on the specific issues raised by the two speakers. Let's go back to the agent now for rebuttal. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, there are actually two agents. Uh, they registered to speak both, so uh, if... Well, the other one can speak now if they want to, but they don't to have divide the them. time. Right, yeah. Okay, so let's just go back to the first we, 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 uh, Yes, we can... Uh, um, the other agent can speak, but they won't. But they don't get double time. So Ashwick, you've been uh, unmuted. Uh, can Salim speak on the application because we are registered for two participants? I'm sorry, as the agent, you get to register for one participant. But we've never told that thing like before. Yes, you did. You just you're the agent. You get now to rebut. You have five minutes to rebut. You can divide that up between you, okay. but, but you have five minutes to rebut between you. I don't mind how yeah, you... Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Let Salim speak, and we can divide the five minutes between us. So Fine. Let's, let's start speak. now. We'll set the clock at zero, and let's start now. Okay, Salim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Salim. Uh, can you please brought up our uh, uh, cover letter, please? 
Thank you very much. Uh, can you please go down and yeah. When did you submit the cover letter? Uh, in yesterday. Uh, yesterday. Yeah, okay. that is late submission though. But uh, just yeah, this one. Yeah. Go down. Uh, <clears throat> dear Chair, uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to me. Uh, if you see the picture of these houses, those houses are already got approval uh, through the you know the city. Uh, we are not asking anything beyond those things. We are asking everything which we already already have the examples on the road, and and um and then we are not changing uh, changing the lot sizes we are not changing we are the houses height of the houses we are keeping as per the law so how height of the over there the bylaw high height is as per the law is 8.5 and our houses height is 8.5 and one more thing uh if you brought up the i sent another email today morning which is a objection uh resolution can you please brought up this email objection resolution Just a minute, please. Yeah. Okay, I can talk um, with regards to, yeah, I can talk, uh, yeah, the objection regulation. Go to the my response, uh, first one. First one, first one, okay. Uh, go to down, little bit down. Here, if you see the response, uh, my neighbor, actually I talked to him, my neighbor, 22 Amsterdam, which is, um, I talked to my, actually the, my uh, client, who, uh, client, uh, the owner of the house, I, the uh, 22 uh, Amsterdam, he was requesting me to move the side entrance and I talked to my uh, landowner and he accepted and we actually moved the side entrance to other side. So two of the complaints who are talking, they are talking about the side entrance. That is we already moved because my, uh, my landowner, he said he wanna leave the house over there. He doesn't want to make any, any uh, issues with the neighbor. And then go to, and then on another, uh, another, um, another, uh, another, um, you know, um, objection of uh, the lady, I forgot her name, sorry to respond. She said, uh, there are the, there are the all, almost 75%, more than 75% houses are actually like that. I know I accept it. That is, but right now everything, everything is changing day by day. And this has to be accepting. It, everybody has to accept it. You can see there are a lot of example on this road. I have already presented presented this in an exhibit exhi exhibit number two. There are a lot of examples, more than more than ten houses. And then we have the we have the flat roof on the road. We have the beach roof on the road. We have the gable roof on the road. So, dear chair, so that is my concern. Like, if you go to the second one, the complaint, uh, please go to the second one. Okay, get to that exactly last pages, the last page. There are 50 application, oh, okay, go, go up, go up, go up, yes. Go up a little bit, little bit, here. Go down, little bit, go down, here. So couple of, couple of complaint, objection, uh, objection I have got, which is sunlight. If you see the sunlight direction, not direction you can see over there, and sunlight direction is blue line. So technically my house is not making any obstacle, any of the house because sunlight is sun when it's set, when, when it rises up, it's coming from the east side is, and down and uh, set at the west side. So technically the direction the sunlight is having over there, entire community, there is no issues with the sunlight. And my, and again, I say, dear chair, my house, the height wise, we are, we are proposing the height as per the bylaw. Only there are minor variances we are requesting, which is couple, only four things, 
which we have the example on this road. So, dear chair, my uh, I'm requesting to all of you guys to accept these changes. We have to move on. We, uh, we have to build the community, of, and we are not changing anything on the community. We I'll ask you to make. Excuse me. I'll ask you to make yeah. your final comments now, please. Yeah, uh, my, my final comments is done. Thank you. Panel members, any questions for this applicant? No. Hearing none. I do have one. Sorry. Mr. Chen, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I truly think that most of the variances are very minor. The only thing that concerns me is the front yard landscape. And I see that as a huge <clears throat> asphalt driveway. The only question I want to ask the applicant is, are you okay, if I'm going to suggest to approve this application, are you okay to turn them into permeable paving? That's a question for you, Agent. Yeah. Uh, can you please uh, repeat the question again? Go ahead. Sorry, the question is to change the asphalt paving of your driveway into permeable paving. Permeable yeah, paving. Right. Currently, currently, we have the la soft landscaping, which is 64%. Now, the question is very specific. Yeah. The question is, would you be? Agreeable to having the driveway so, dear, finished yeah, in permeable dear, yes. pavers. Uh, yes. So currently, yes, we can do that. Thank we you. We can do that. Thank you. Okay. At this point, let's take the application into committee. For sure. I just have I just have one question. Go ahead. Please. Go ahead. Um, could I hear your response to the objectors' comments about? Um, the design of the building or the built form not meeting, in their opinion, the character of the immediate neighborhood? Uh, if you see my picture I have attached with the, with the application, my cover letter, you can see the build form over there. Some of them are Yeah, my cover letter. My cover letter, please. Yeah. Yeah. Look, some of them are, yes, some of them are gable roof. Some of them are definitely flat roof. So it's a mixed. And these are all actually the, you know, the custom made houses. So if you see 76 and 76A and 76B, you can see 76, yeah, you can see. Even 86 and 88, if you see, our house is the flat roof and those houses also also flat roof. And rest of the thing, we have, you know, uh, we have the porch in front, every house has the porch and the garage. So. Dear uh, committee member, um, I think it goes on the, this community, on this land, on this uh, 20 Amsterdam. Thank you. Any further questions? Hearing none, we shall take this application then into committee for a motion. First, there might be some comments from panel members. Panel members, comments? Mr. Chen, go ahead. Uh, I'll just uh, make a comment and perhaps even a proposal as well. Uh, I think the variances are very minor. Specifically, um, they didn't ask for any setbacks. The only footprint changes is uh, is on the floor space index and also the uh, the lot coverage. So we often see in Toronto the the, the floor space index could even go up to one upon nine, and what they're asking for is from point six to point seven, which I think is reasonable. Same thing for the uh, changes of the coverage is thirty five to thirty seven. Still didn't have any issue with the setbacks, and the applicant is okay with uh, with the driveway being uh, you know applied with permeable paving. So 
Item number two, I think is acceptable as well. And for the reason of that, and I understand the, the concern of the neighbors as well, uh, but I really think that the <clears throat> if we are just looking at at the design, at the scale of the application, I think it does meet the criteria. So I would like to support this application. Any other comments? Ms. Hayes. I'm struggling with this one a little bit um, uh, for the main point of, of the official plan test with respect to the physical character of, you know, of, of the neighborhood and the immediate versus the the broader. Um, I think the variances on their own um, do not cause me a lot of concern. I'm having a little bit of a, um, a challenge with the physical character uh, test under the neighborhood's policy of the OP. That's where I'm struggling a bit. Mm -hmm. Mr. Salomon? Yeah. Um, I, I don't have any problem with a new two-story um, house on this property. I do have concerns with the front yard soft landscaping and so I would support a motion that would require that the uh, driveway be a permeable material. Okay. I, I'm, I'm struggling I, I'm struggling with it a bit too because I thought the two speakers in opposition um, when I put their two comments together it made sense to me that uh, in the immediate context of the the large area of smaller lots that are bungalows, that uh, this will certainly stand out. Now, as of right, they can they can build this built form, but but um, as the first speaker was saying, um, why not do so within the uh, within the limits of the uh, of the bylaw? Uh, and I was concerned, I am concerned about the, the front yard soft landscaping. Um, but when I look at the actual numbers involved, uh, they are, as Mr. Chang has pointed out, fairly minor. They are minor. I'm, it's only a coverage issue of going from 35 to 37.43. So, yeah, I'm. Mr. Hayes, go ahead. I was just going to add, having said that, though, when you look at the what is resulting in the the built form and the variance for sidewalls, it is quite it is quite minor in the context. Um, I think physical character is changing. It hasn't quite hit this that block yet, um, but that's my struggle. But I can support the application if. The permeable pavers for the landscaping is uh, part of of the motion. Well, let's let's go to a motion then. Is anyone ready with a motion? Mr. Salomon, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'll I'll move a motion to approve the variances subject to urban forestry condition number three, and also subject to that the driveway as be of permeable material. Is there a second to that motion? It is seconded by Mr. Cheng. Moved and seconded to approve. Those in favor, show of hands, please. Those opposed, let the record show that Mullock was opposed. The motion is carried by a vote of three to one, and the application is so approved. With that, the panel moves on to item number four. Item number four today is 92 Brookside Drive. On this application, panel has before it submitted materials, including two photographs of trees on site, cover letter from the agent, presentation materials from the applicants received March 23, and tree plans from October. We have comment from city planning. And we have support correspondence from 64 Brookside, and 19 form letters in support from owners and occupants, 29 Castles Ave, 
11, 15, 19, 74, 76, 78, 82, 88, 90, 94, 96, Brookside, 95, 105, and 109, Burgess, 27, 31, 37, and 41, Firstbrook, received before March the 17th. So, checking with the moderator. Moderator, it is a fact that we have one speaker in opposition registered. Okay, let's have the, uh, the agent join us then, please. By stating Hello. your name. Yeah. Hi, my name is James Twine. James, good morning to you. You have five minutes to, pre to present your uh, application to the panel. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, so in the cover letter that we submitted, I just described the overall rationale for the project, which was uh, the, I'm looking at a slide for 102 Donlands, which is not the right address right now. Just Chair, the presentation material uh, that was part of our package was not, was for 102 Donlands, so with the wrong application. Yeah, that's not our, presentation. I, I did not submit a presentation to the just the drawings and uh, the support letters are for 92 Brookside. I think now we, well we have the drawings up then now. Cover. Here are the drawings for 92 yes. Brookside. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And so you would like me to proceed with a the presentation then? If, if you, you, don't, you don't have to, um, but you have the opportunity to if you wish. Okay. Sure, I can, yeah, so as I said in the cover letter, the overall rationale for the project is the owner of the house has lived in the neighborhood for 22 years now and is in his early 60s and is planning to, uh, for aging in place in the current residence and also uh, to have uh, his children and possibly grandchildren in the house uh, with him as he does so. And so looking to expand the overall uh, square footage and make this uh, and accommodate that the, the living arrangements as he sees fit. Uh, and so that involves a, a, a modest uh, rear addition to the ground floor, a very modest rear addition to the second floor and a third floor addition to the top. Uh, we've attempted to work with the existing form in the neighborhood. The third floor addition is set uh, back to the existing ridge line of the house uh, and uh, not, we feel not to be extremely visually impactful from the street or to any of the neighbors. The owner has uh, obviously evidenced by the letters of support that he's garnered uh, has has shown this to uh, a wide selection of, of people in the neighborhood and has received uh, very positive feedback and comments uh, regarding the proposal and feels that, uh, and I feel, and he does as well, that it's um, the variances being requested are overall minor in nature and the project would be uh, positive for the neighborhood as a, as a whole. Thank you very much. Panel, any questions for, there is a question, Ms. Hayes, go ahead. Um, I just, before we get to the objector, um, in the planning, uh, the email from planning, they had made a comment with respect to the height and wanted to, your response about whether or not you'd be prepared to uh, lower that given some of the um, ceiling heights noted in the plans. I didn't see a response to that email. Could was you that from Sean? Was that from Sean Galbraith? Was that the planner, the email? No, no a city planner. So it's an email, uh, email of March the 16th from, from so, Sean Gunther. Oh, yes. Sean Gunther, sorry, yeah, I had his name incorrect. Yeah, so I did provide a response to that. Um, um, uh, I don't see it as part of our, or, or I can't immediately see it. Could you verbally tell me what you had responded? Sure, I can, I mean, I can, I can literally read it to you. Um, it was in Cindy Long, who was the, uh, who was the, who I'd been corresponding with back and forth at uh, the CA application was, was uh, CC'd on that email as well. 
So I'm surprised that she didn't make it part of the of the package. But uh, maybe I just missed it. But if you could okay. just let me know. Yeah, that's you. fine. Of course. Um, yeah. So uh, it, this is, and it essentially uh, is is uh, similar to what I had said in the cover letter regarding the height. But I think Sean slightly misunderstood the the overall height uh, as being. He, he misunderstood the third floor ceiling height as being higher than what it was. And so the, uh, my response to him says, the overall height of the project is proposed to be 10.33, but that is only the dormer section that is above the 10 meter height. So the majority of the flat roof at the third floor is at 9.57 meters. Um, and the proposed dormer, which does rise to 10.33, is set back from all sides and we feel to not be visually impactful from the street or the surrounding areas. And the rationale for this dormer is to introduce some south sunlight into the third floor space at a high level with a clear story window uh, to provide direct sunlight in the winter months, but when the sun is when the sun is lower, but in the summer months it would provide indirect uh, shaded light at that south side. Uh, and the intention is that one of the clear story windows will be operable to allow for natural ventilation uh, Thank to you. minimize okay. reliance. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I did read that. I yeah, just didn't okay. realize it was a direct response to that yeah. planning email. I yes. apologize. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, our concern is our concern is height. Um, t tell me, um, what what is the uh, interior ceiling height on the third floor? It would be eight feet. It's eight feet. Okay. Yes. And uh, variance number and two. Excuse me. Variance number two. Um, the 10.11 meters is the entire length of the of the uh, side exterior main wall. No, it's only that dormer section. It's only um, the dormer section. It's only the dormer section. Yes, the main, the third, the main, the overall length of the third floor side wall is the roof is at 9.57 meters. There. Okay, thank you. All right. Any further questions now, panel? We have we do have a speaker registered. Okay, moderator. Marlene, you've been unmuted. Um, my name is Alan Stokel, and I own uh, the property on 29 First Brook Road, along with Marlene Chimay. Uh And for some reason, her name popped up. So may I go ahead and you uh, may. speak? You may, of course. You are registered. Uh, you are Your registered. name is on the uh, on the registration. So go ahead. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, the um, uh, my objection, by the way, I just like very quickly to let everyone know who hasn't been on Brookside or First Brook Road, these are all um, two-story uh, single-family dwellings. Usually, um, usually they're, uh, uh, you know, two houses side by side. Um, and they're, they all look like that. So, um, you know, very much like the East York uh, thing that you uh, did before, um, I'm very concerned uh, that uh, the 10-meter uh, the height um, there's no uh, other buildings in the neighborhood that are that high, so uh, I don't understand why that's acceptable. Uh, you know, and it's it's uh, it's more than just uh, than just a minor variance. Now, the uh, the other uh, issue that I have is uh, the three meters over the sidewall height. This is definitely not a minor variance. Three meters. That's quite. I mean, that's what over ten feet or something. All right. So at at any rate. The um, what what that also means uh, for us is the the floor space. Now um, I I understand the owner of the property uh, says you know very much like me he's retiring and he wants to have his his uh, sons uh, come from university and all that stuff. But the reality is that when once you build a property that large like a a super home, then you, um, the next owner, or for that matter, even the owner when things change, uh, that could very easily be a rental property, as there are many rental properties around here. And what they usually do is split them into two or three separate areas, which means there's two or three separate households. And of course, that gets into a parking issue uh, because they're um, one of the things they wanted to do was get rid of the parking. And um, now I have parking pad, so uh, or we have a parking pad, so um, I'm not objecting to that. For me, 
Uh, however, um, people do park in front of my driveway because there is no other place to park sometimes. It's, we live in the beaches and when there's festivals, etc., it gets really, really crowded. So um, I, I think that's, you know, just for the neighborhood and the way things look and, you know, keeping the peace, that's uh, very definitely um, an issue. And basically, um, my concern is when I go up to East York and look at these monster homes that are being put on properties uh, that were originally were supposed to be one and a half story bungalows, uh, I am thinking, is that what, you know, are, are we going to have to put up with that? Uh, I don't think it's good for the neighborhood, for the children in the neighborhood. There's a park at the top of the street. There's a school at the bottom. This is no place to have monster homes. Thank you very much for your uh, for your time. Thank you. Any questions for this speaker panel? Hearing none, we shall return to the agent um, who will have an opportunity to respond to that. Just those issues, please, in rebuttal. Go ahead, agent. Sure. Um, well, I would, I mean, I would, I suppose I would take issue with the description of the proposal as a monster home. Uh, I don't think that's what it is. And I think it is within a reasonable, uh, a reasonable uh, FSI uh, for the neighborhood. Uh, and given what the owner intends to use it as a single family dwelling, the intention is not to, to uh, create a rental property in any case whatsoever. Um, the the parking, the issue that the, the objector brought up about parking, uh, we are not intending to take away a parking space. There is no parking space currently at the property. There is an existing right of way between the, the property and the property to the north. Uh, and so nobody parks in that driveway currently. They all park on the street. Um, and so we are not intending to take away a parking space uh, at all. Um, and I would just, I would reiterate uh, my argument from before that I think that the, uh, the owner who's sort of longstanding uh, base in the neighborhood is, his intention is to stay in the neighborhood and to, to use this as a single family dwelling. And I think uh, the proposal that we have submitted is, is uh, reasonable and acceptable within the sort of evolving character of the city as uh, as people's needs change as they age uh, as they age in place thank you very much uh, I have a question for you and it's this yeah. um, has the uh, the owner of the other the other half of the semi yes expressed agreement on this and if so in what in what form did they do that uh, he has expressed agreement uh, during the whole process uh, of planning this proposal. He has submitted one of the letters of support that is uh, okay. that has been submitted there, and the owner of the property to the north as well across the right of way has also submitted a letter of support. Thank you. Further questions for the applicant panel? I am not hearing any further questions, so we can at this stage then take this application into committee for a motion. Um, unless there, anyone has a comment beforehand, but we can go to a motion. I'll look to someone to do so. Mr. Salomon, please proceed. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to move a motion to approve the variances subject to community planning conditions and also a condition that ties approval uh, to the site plan and elevation drawings. That way that issue of the height, overall height and side heights gets captured so that only a small portion of the, of the actual building can actually reach that particular height. Very good, very good condition to attach. It is seconded by Ms. Hayes. So moved and seconded to so approve. Those in favor, show of hands, please. That vote is unanimous and the motion, or the motion is carried. The application is so approved. And the panel moves along to number 5, 21 McGee Street. 21 McGee. Hi, Mr. Chair. Is number 5 and number 6 together? 
Number five and number six together, okay. Through you, Mr. Chair, I think we should separate this just because there are uh, different variances. Got it. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we should separate it. Um, I would, I, th I think the applicant um, in making their presentation, and I'm going to uh, ask the applicant for a presentation on this one because even though there are no registered speakers in opposition, I'd still like the benefit of, a, of an application. So I'd ask the applicant to make a brief presentation, an overview of what is in mind for the two sites involved in the two applications, and then we'll deal with the two applications one at a time. So applicant, uh, please join us. Uh, hi there, can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. My name is Ken Kane. Uh, I am from Cassidy and Company. We are the designers for both sides of the semi here, acting on behalf of Paul Fattel and Larry McGuire for 19 McGee, and Mark Bishop and Lana Russell for 21 McGee. I understand that you want to hear each application separately. So if I can first speak regarding... Just, just a second. Now, what, what we're going to do, uh, Mr. Kane, we're going, to, we're going to vote on them separately because they are separate ownership. But okay. in your presentation, um, you might be able, I think it probably makes sense to us to get a, a the full picture, would be if you could, in your presentation, um, speak to your concept and your vision for the entire, the entire project, both, both sides. Okay, Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the existing, the existing home, homeowner wishes to enclose on both the left and right side of the semi, an existing third floor balcony that is exposed uh, to the elements. They want to enclose it to increase the gross floor area right above the permitted. And for 19 McGee, we are seeking to increase the permitted floor space index from 145.14 square meters to, to increase it by 108 square feet. So as zoning, we're increasing the floor space index to 1.08. For 21 McGee, they also want to enclose uh, an exterior third floor balcony. And they want to, again, increase the uh, floor space index to 1.08 per the bylaw, which is increasing the GFA by 121 square feet. As you can see in our presentation, uh, if you can bring it up, we, we show at the back, we have a picture of what is existing for both 19 and 21 McGee. If you can, yeah, right there, there's 19 McGee that's existing currently. And then a little farther down would be, you can see on the other side, what's existing for 21 McGee. They wanna take that balcony that's exposed, that's open to the outside and enclose it to a livable space. Our client has been transparent. If you slide down, you can see, you can see a plan and an elevation that shows what we want to propose for 21 McGee, where they're, they're enclosing the balcony there with just an ensuite for the master bedroom, where it just has a vanity, a tub, toilet, and a shower. And the same for 19 McGee, there is, uh, I think it's a little further up in our presentation, showing what they're proposing on the third floor balcony. Again, they want to enclose it to put a master bedroom, primary bedroom ensuite with vanity, toilet, tub, and shower. Okay. Now our client has been very transparent with the neighbors in their wishes to enclose the third floor balcony. And in saying that, we have submitted two letters of support from 12 McGee and 23 McGee Street. 
We feel that the variance to increase the floor space index is minor in nature, provides additional GFA for the homeowners without creating any adverse impact on the appearance. It doesn't change the footprint of the dwelling. The building height remains the same, the massing and scale and setbacks. It is in our opinion that the requested variance satisfies the intent of the official plan and maintains the intent of the zoning bylaw and has negligible impact on the neighboring property. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, panel members, any questions here about Ms. Hayes? Go ahead. No? Question, I'd just be prepared to move a motion. Go ahead. Okay. Let's move a motion uh, on number if my, five. If my colleagues have no uh, further com any comment, I'd be prepared to move a motion, and I'll start uh, with uh, 20, if we're doing them separately, uh, 21 McGee. Uh, I'd like to move a motion to approve the application as I believe what is being proposed is indeed minor in closing an existing or portion of an existing third floor deck. I don't believe there's any greater impact and I think it meets the four tests and that would be my motion for number 21, McGee. Is there a second? It is seconded, Mr. Cheng. Moved and seconded to approve on 21, McGee. Those in favor, show of hands, please. That motion is carried. The application number five for 21 McGee is approved. So I'll move, I'll move on to 19 McGee, item number uh, six. Um, I also believe, as this is just basically a mirror of uh, what is being proposed for number five, although the variances may slightly differ between the two, I believe this application also meets the four tests. I don't believe there's any greater impact. I believe it's minor and it's appropriate. And I'd like to move a motion to approve the application. Thank you. Second to that. Seconded once again, Mr. Cheng. It is moved and seconded to approve. Those in favor, show of hands, please. And a unanimous vote carries that motion. And number 6, 19 McGee, is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. We move on to number seven, which is... Mr. Chair, could we have five minutes? We can take five minutes. So at this point, um, we've been going for a couple of hours. The, uh, the panel will take a... Well, we'll just take a brief, brief five-minute recess and resume, in, resume at uh, 11.40. Thank you. Thank you.
so dark out. I had to turn have to turn some lights on, otherwise I'm in shadow. <laughs> We resume, and we resume with item number seven, which is 54 Indian Road Crescent. On this application, before the panel are those uh, uh, materials submitted by the applicant and an arborist report prepared by Tom Bradley of Wellwind Consulting, dating back to December. So. Let's have the agent join us, please. Good morning, members of the committee, Mr. Chair. My name is Curtis Van Kulen. Good morning, Curtis. Okay. Um, panel members, on this application, uh, is there any request for a presentation? Hearing none. Okay, then. Uh, any questions for the agent? No. Then I'll look to panel for a motion, please. Mr. Solomon, go ahead. Yeah, I think the variances are uh, minor in nature, very minor, and so I would move approval of the variances with no conditions. Thank you. That is seconded by Ms. Hayes. It is moved and seconded to approve. Those in favor, show of hands, please. Thank you. And there a unanimous vote carries the motion and the application is so approved. Panel moves along to item number eight, 159 Indian Road Crescent. Here we have before us applicants' materials, two photographs of trees, uh, a 2020 COA decision, email correspondence from the applicant, October 29, and a tree declaration plan from VG Architects, November. 21. There is a staff report from Urban Forestry. And we have in opposition correspondence from 142 Indian Road, 82 Abbott, 161 Indian Road Crescent, 155 Indian Road Crescent, plus 98 Abbott Avenue.
So let's have the agent join us, please. Hello, uh, my name is Peter Burton. I'm the owner and the uh, architect for the property. Good, good morning. Um, okay, you have five minutes to, uh, to present your application to the panel. Please go ahead. Sure. The uh, first uh, variance is required uh, because the allowable is eight meters wide by 10 meters long. Because the property is oddly shaped as an L shape, uh, the building is 10 meters wide by eight meters long, but it's not actually eight meters long, it's only 7.34. So the size of the building isn't the issue. Um, it's just that it's been rotated and the following the letter of the definition of side yard and or width and length, it's kind of an odd situation. I show a diagram there where you'd be allowed the building if it was rotated 90 degrees. The second thing um, is that the, uh, the soft landscaping, it hasn't changed at all. In fact, uh, I've increased the soft landscaping in front of the uh, built where the entrance to the house is, the laneway house, and the existing parking area and uh, um, landscaped areas are the same as they are existing. Um, the, uh, the other thing is uh, the 7.5 meters um, from an ancillary building containing a laneway six is the ancillary um, laneway suite our building is 6.3 meters high. I'm just asking for a bit more height because I want to be able to add extra ins I want I'm thinking of going to a passive house design and if we ha if we shorten the house it's hard to get an extra insulation and I also want to be open to having a, a green roof I want to look into the option of that right uh, when we get the approval so it's just one foot extra of height to allow for that extra insulation and then the minimum required side yard back setback it's I, I'm not sure she it says the north lot line here is 1.5 meters away from the, the lot, I guess the back, the rear lot line is 0.1 meters. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what the definitions are because of the L-shaped lot again, this is what's confusing me. But the objections that I've seen are to do with parking. Um, I'm not here for a variance on the parking. There are two existing old garages there which are used for storage currently and they're not for a local people's parking. There's uh, one is storing an antique car and the other one storing a, uh, a bunch of junk, uh, which is rented by a tenant. Uh, regarding the wood side, there was an objection of wood siding. I'm not a, I'm not a, a stuck with wood siding. It just seemed to be the natural thing to do. And um, I think 82 Abbott Avenue had a concern about, I think one of the suggestions was concerned about adjacent buildings. Now I'm an architect and we've been building building. I've been building buildings for 40 years and we know how to build buildings in tight sites. And we're very, very careful about um, taking care of our neighbors. I mean, I'm going to be living here. So I, I really want to have happy neighbors and tenants. And we know that uh, to build a building, there is some disruption, disruption, but we always take great care in hiring uh, contractors who are, able to uh, deliver a project with a minimum amount of disruption and also the two adjacent buildings that they're referring to are garages their, fo their foundations uh, i don't know how deep they go but they're not more than four feet and neither will ours so we won't be undermining any adjacent foundations at all so it's perfectly um, perfectly standard practice to be building buildings in two garages adjacent to each other or, or to, and, and a laneway suite adjacent to a garage in Toronto, so I'm not sure that the uh, the issue is a really big issue for our neighbors, and I know that we'll take care of them. Um, I, on that note, um, I'd, uh, I'll leave it with you. Thank you very much. Panel members, would you like to pose questions now, or wait till we hear from the speakers? I'm just I'm going to pose a question now, and that is um, the uh, the 2020 application to the Committee of Adjustment was refused. You were the agent on that one as well. Um, how does this application vary or differ from that application that was refused? Well, it was, the, the was refused because the, they said it was too big and I reduced it greatly in size by about uh, 35%. Now it's this, the, the size of it now is within the, 
the rules for laneway houses. So I reduced it in size uh, by quite a bit. Thank you. Okay. Let's go then to the speakers who are standing by. Uh, Andrew, you've been unmuted. Yes, can you hear me? We do hear you, Andrew. What's your name? Thank you. Stay safe. My name is Andrew Freeman, 155 Indian Road Crescent. Please go can ahead. Can you hear me right? Should I speak up louder? You're, you're, we're hearing you loud and clear. You have five minutes. Go ahead. We would like to summarize uh, the um, main points from our written submission. We have uh, objections to three of the variances. We doubt that the intent of the official plan is to create more affordable housing at the expense of reducing garage parking and thereby increasing the pressure on street parking. The parking math is very simple. The occupants of a new laneway suite would probably need a car. Reducing require car if the existing garage is demolished in the process of constructing the uh, laneway suite two cars would have to find street parking that is the garage car and the occupants car a more um, a non-sustainable situation would develop at uh, of choking in in street parking the logical conclusion therefore is that the official plan envisages this form of densification in a manner where the existing garage is retained and construction of the laneway suite takes place above and behind the existing garage. In this context, we would like to draw the attention of the committee to the laneway suite being built at 76 Kenneth. We believe that this is an, a model of a laneway suite, since uh, it is constructed over and at the back of the existing garage, and the existing garage is an integral part of the laneway suite. In conclusion, we would like to sub... Uh, in contrast, in contrast, correction, we would like to submit to the committee that the proposal is perhaps precedent setting in that not one, but three garage parking spots are to be demolished in the process of constructing one laneway suite. Our objections, uh, we've pulled together very number, numbered one and four, which are the setback and the size of the building. We object to the building width of 10 meters and the eight meter bylaw width should be maintained. The ideal laneway suite would be constructed over and at the back of the existing two-car garage which fronts onto the laneway and so preserving two of the three existing garage parking spots. Failing this ideal situa situ situation, the laneway suite should be kept at the eight meter width and set back from the lane sufficient to permit one outdoor parking spot with a minimum width of 2.6 meters parallel to the north side of the proposed suite. This is not an ideal situation, but a compromise. It means that only a, a less, one less street parking permit would be required. Uh, our objection to variance listed as number two, which is the soft landscape. The enclave of the th three triplexes, 155, 157, and 159 Indian Road Crescent, is served by one mutual driveway. There are a total of nine units in the complex, six are three bedroom and three are two bedroom. In addition to the two garage, garages on the 159 property, both 155 and 157 have a double car garage. In total, 13 cars can be parked legally in the enclave. There is always congestion and parking is always an issue. We speak from an experience of over 30 years. Regarding the parking situation 
on the 159 property. Three cars, one from each unit, are par parked outside as shown on the photo in the file submission. I'll be very grateful if you could uh, show or, or consult that photo uh, because it tells a story. Uh, they occupy when tightly packed a uh, width of 7.8 meters. The proposed reduction in soft landscaping would provide parking width of 5.8 meters or the equivalent of two parking spots. As mentioned, three cars are currently parked in this area and occupy a width of 7.8 meters. One additional car for the occupants of the Lame Suite means the need for four parking spots. But the proposal provides space for all. I'll ask for your two. final comment now, please. In conclusion, there is only one solution to minimizing the need for more street permit parking and upholding the soft landscaping bylaw. It is to retain the double car garage as part of the laneway suite. Two cars would park in the garage, one car could be parked parallel to the west side of the new laneway suite, therefore only one- Thank you, your time is up. Any questions, panel, for this speaker? Okay. Do we have another speaker, moderator? David, you've been unmuted. Uh, um, is, is it for my turn, David White? Yes, is this David? Yes. Okay, David, you're loud and clear. Good. I, I live at um, David, my name is David White. I live at 173 Indian Road, Crescent. Um, I own the property there. I have no objection to the proposal. The only thing I would like to see is a condition, if it's possible, if, if it's within your jurisdiction, and that is in compensation for the deficiency in soft landscaping, I would like to um, uh, request that the that the condition be that, uh, that the city, uh, subject to, to urban forestry's approval, that the city plant a, a shade tree on the Indian Road Crescent frontage on the city boulevard there. Um, I don't know if you can make that a condition of approval if you're, if you're inclined to approve the, the, the proposal. Um, if it can't be a condition, perhaps uh, Mr. Burton could at least give an undertaking that he'll support the the installation of a of a of a of a large shade tree on the Indian Road uh, Crescent City Boulevard. There used to actually be uh, some years ago, quite a few years ago now, an enormous poplar tree there, which the city took down. Um, I think they I think it was kind of getting near the end of its life, and it wasn't a particularly good tree for a city uh, situation. Um, so, um, if we could, the, 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 the front lot is quite quite large, so it could support, I, I believe, a, a shade tree, and of course that would all be subject to, to urban forestry. I notice urban forestry has asked for payment in lieu, uh, which is which is fine. But if we could actually get the tree established there, that would be that would be good. Those those are my submissions. Questions, Pat? questions, Pat? Okay, then, are there any further speakers? No. Let's go back then to the applicant who will have a chance to respond in rebuttal to just the issues which were raised by the two speakers. Hi, it's Peter Burton again. Um, I'd be perfectly willing to have a tree planted there. I'd plant it myself if, they, if that's the requirement. The city t tends to go around and plant trees on our... I live over right now next nearby and they replaced the tree on my property it was a sugar maple i'd be happy to have that done here because i'm going to be moving into this laneway house the second uh, thing is the whole thing about parking i i'm not asking for a parking variance i'm just asking for the actually the main thing is the the, the minor setback at the rear and the uh and the shape of the building being eight by ten instead of ten by eight 
And uh, it seems odd that I had to come to committee for this to get that, but I, I'm here because it seems reasonable to request that. So um, in terms of parking, um, the three tenants that are parking there now, they do not have leases on those parking spaces. There, it, there's no agreement to provide parking. I, I'm fairly lax with them right now because I don't want to, um, I don't think it's a big deal, but I'd be willing to limit that to the two spaces, but they, they typically park, there's three spaces there now and it's the existing area of the landscaping. So not sure it's, um, I don't see congestion back there. I go there all the time and the cars are moving in and out, but I don't see any big congestion problems. I'll leave it at that. Okay, we'll see if the panel has questions for you. I know I have one. There's Ms. Hayes, go ahead, please. Hi, thank you. Um, just one question uh, related to parking. So if you're removing the, um, um, the uh, brick garage on the one, uh, one side of the lot, does the surface parking then um, still meet the requirements for the the uh, triplex that's there? You have enough spots without that garage? Well, I, su I, I would guess so because I've made an application for a preliminary project review on several occasions and this such subject has never come up. I believe the parking bylaws have been relaxed. I'm not sure though. Yeah, I mean, no, I just, uh, the question was, I, you know, you don't need a parking variance for the laneway suite. I just, the existing um, yeah, there's, there's. That no, was this, my question. If you understand what I was getting at, I don't, think the, I don't think the garages are required. No. But the, the so the parking spots within the garage are not counting towards your required parking that you need for the triplex. That's my question. No, not that I know of, and I don't use them for the triplex. It's storage right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Further questions for the applicant panel. Hearing none, let's take this application then into committee for a motion. Uh, Mr. Salomon, go ahead. I, I, I have more of a question for uh, us internally. Um, Joanne, do you recall why this was refused back in May of 2021? I think you might have been on that panel. Do you recall like what was the, the reasoning? As the applicant noted, um, my recollection was uh, the size of the structure. Uh, originally, they were going for a, a, a width of 13.67, um, soft landscaping of 35%, a height of 6.55 meters. So uh, from a width, width perspective anyway, um, it's much different, but my recollection of that day is um, that it was um, a very, very large building that was being proposed um, and the width was the one of the major concerns but you know the the um, cumulative impact I can't speak for the other members no, on that panel but that's my recollection uh -huh. okay that's great that's helpful thank you and that would be I, I asked the, the applicant what he uh, why it had been refused in 2020 and that was that was be consistent with his answer too Okay, Ms. Hayes, go ahead. Thank you. I think that what's be before the committee now, um, in my opinion, from an impact perspective and a built form perspective, is um, quite different than what we were asked to consider before. I think that what is being proposed now, although the width um, is a little wider, that I think the configuration of the lot lends to to um, some of that. The landscaping is, is not any more deficient than it already exists. Um, I'm not concerned with respect to the small height variance and the setback is, is currently in existing. So in its present form, I could support the application subject to forestry condition number two. Those would be my thoughts. Okay. Um. Are you, would you like to make that a motion? If my colleagues have no further comments, certainly I'd like to move a motion to approve the application subject to forestry condition number two. Second to that motion, is there one? There is one, Mr. Chang. 
So it is moved and seconded to approve subject to forestry. Those in favor, show of hands, please. And that is a, a unanimous vote to carry the motion. The application is so approved. Subject to forestry. And the panel moves on to item number nine. Two twelve Park Hill Parkview Hills Crescent. Before us are the material submitted by the applicant. There's an arborist report from November. There are commenting agency reports from Urban Forestry, from TRCA, and there's a staff report, a staff report actually from TRCA in addition. And there is support correspondence from the homeowner at two ten Parkview Hill. Hills Crescent received 10th of March. <laughs> and on this application, we'll have the uh, have the agent join us now, please. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh Hello, yes, this is Lynn Houston. I'm the designer for this project. Very good, good afternoon. Okay, mm -hmm. panel members, any, any re requests here for a presentation? Any questions for the, the agent? No? I'm not hearing any, so in that case, we can take the application into no. committee. Oh, yes, Ms. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, having reviewed all the material on file and including the response from TRCA, I believe the variances being requested are indeed minor and appropriate. And I would like to move a motion to approve the application with no conditions. Very good. Is there a second to that? That is seconded, Mr. Salomon. Moved and seconded to approve. Those in favor, show of hands, please. It is a unanimous vote. Motion is carried and the application is Approved. Thank you. Number 10, 496, Donlands. On this application before us, the only materials are those submitted by the application, or by the applicant in, in the original submission. So let's have the applicant join us, please. Yes, hello, can you hear me? We do hear you. State your name, please. Uh, yep. My name is Murray Fern. I'm representing the owners of 496 Donlands Avenue for the uh, proposed new garage at the uh, rear of the property. Very good. Okay, panel members, on this application, does anyone think they'd benefit from a presentation? Anyone have questions for the agent? I'm not hearing any, so let's take it into. Uh, take it into, into committee for a motion. And Ms. Hayes, go ahead. Thank you. Having reviewed the materials on file, uh, the new garage is, is basically a reciting of the uh, existing garage. It may be slightly larger. I don't think that the variances being requested are major, would have any different impact, and I would be prepared to move a motion to approve the application with no conditions. Thank you. Second to that. There is Mr. Cheng, so moved and seconded to approve. Those in favor, please show hands. A unanimous vote. Carries the motion and the application is approved. That takes the panel to item number 11. For, pardon me, 173, Chaplin. Now on this one, I understand there is a request to defer. Yes, okay. And this is the one that the uh, the applicant was, the agent was on another, yeah. another uh, with the other panel at 9.30, so fine. Is that agent free to join us now? Good. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair, members. Ida Evangelista on behalf of the owner of 173 Chaplin. Thank you very much for uh, holding this for me. Uh, as I've just been retained for this project, I had the opportunity to review the variances along with 
um, opposition from 177 and 175. Um, on that note, I would like the opportunity to defer this hearing today to allow us time to modify the plans, meet with the neighbors. I did speak to Ms. Mullins. Um, and I did instruct, I did let her know that I was going to be deferring. Unfortunately, I did not have the contact information for 177. Um, however, I believe we're all on the same page now that, you know, we do want to modify. We are going to work together. And Mr. Chair, as you know, I always like working with the neighbors. Okay. T tell me this. Um, so the, uh, the request is based upon your thought that you can substantially alter the application in such a way as to uh, to gain support from the neighbors. I believe so, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yes, I believe well, we can all work together and 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 achieving something that you know suits everyone's satisfaction. Okay. Very good. Thank. You. Now, for, just for the uh, information of of all concerned. For the information of all concerned, the actual decision about whether or not to defer belongs to the Committee of Adjustment. We'll make that, that call. We do have a request from the applicant to do so, but we also have various um, speakers registered and standing by to speak to the application today um, in opposition. So what I'm going to do now is to briefly canvas those speakers standing by and I'm going to be asking them this one question, and that is whether they would um, be agreeable or be in favor of allowing the application to be deferred in order to allow the opportunity for consultation with the agent trying to um, make substantial change to the application in such a way as to get to a uh, a point where they could support it. So that's my question. So let's not get into the detail of the of the actual application, just your your willingness or lack thereof to see it deferred. Um, we don't have to defer it. We could go ahead and hear the application today. So let's go to the first speaker then who's standing by. State your name, please, and join us. Good morning, Mr. Chair. My name is Mullen, M-U-L-L-I-N, initial K, and I'm counsel for Janice Mandel, the owner of 175 Chaplain Crescent. Yes. Ms. Mandel does consent to the deferral. I confirm that I spoke with Ms. Evangelista earlier this week, and my client is interested in working with the applicant to see if her concerns can be addressed. Thank you very much for that. Let's go on to the next Speaker standing by. Join us, please, by stating your name. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the other uh, people registered in opposition have left uh, the room. So there's just, just the one speaker in yes. opposition? Okay. Who has indicated a willingness to see deferral. Okay. The decision is, however, that, that of the panels. So, uh, panel, we have a request to defer. Um, one speaker standing by in opposition is agreeable to the, de you know, that concept, but the decision is yours. So uh, I look to panel members for a motion with respect to this request to defer. Mr. Solomon, go ahead. Mr. Solomon, you are muted. Sorry, uh, let's try again. I'm going to move approval of the um, request for deferral, and that would give an opportunity for the applicant to meet with the adjacent neighbors to see what revisions can be made. Is there a second? It is seconded, Ms. Hayes. So, moved and seconded to defer. Those in favor, please show hands. And that's a unanimous vote, which carries that motion and... Uh, the application is so deferred to the next available date. We move along to item number 12, 411, Beresford Avenue. On 411 Beresford, before us are submitted materials, Arborist Report, 
dating to December. There is correspondence both in support and in opposition. 11 form letters in support from 339, 365, 373, 374, 379, 381, 383, 384, 394, 414, and 431, Beresford. In opposition, there is correspondence from 410, Beresford, 417, 425, 413, and 415, Beresford. And there is a 41 signature petition in opposition, signed by the owners and occupants of 10 addresses on Beresford Avenue, four on Arda, one from 660 Annette, all received before March 22nd. On this application, um, we'll, we'll ask the agent now to join us by stating your name. Hello, uh, my name is Daniel Dobrojansky, and I'm the homeowner and applicant of 411 Beresford. Very good. You'll have five minutes starting now to present your application to the panel. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, committee chair and fellow committee members. As uh, stated, my name is Daniel, and I'm the applicant and homeowner of 411 Beresford Avenue. I'm able to provide a quick presentation uh, if the committee desires, but I'm assuming since there's objections, then we're going to go proceed with the, with the presentation. Go ahead. The proposed application is to completely renovate the current two-story house by extending the current house footprint by 2.1 meters to the front, 4.8 meters to the rear, adding a partial third floor story to the current footprint, adding a front and rear balcony, and including a rear deck, front stairs, and canopy. The proposed variances are outlined in a supporting presentation to committee members, and I would like to review uh, them one by one. The proposed building height is compatible with surrounding neighborhood with other houses exceeding 10 meters in height, and more specifically, recent approvals of Beresford Avenue. Our, our minor variance request is only 14 centimeters above the current bylaw, which is about 1.4%. Visual impacts are mitigated by a considerate design with a third story addition being set back in the front and rear. The main front and rear walls are limited to 7.75 meters, and side walls are 9.89 limited to the center of the proposed house, again, to mitigate the visual impacts and massing from the street and rear of the property. The, propo the proposed side yard setback on the south side of the house is for the proposed front and rear main and second floor additions that is built in line with the existing side wall. This, re this request is to, to bring the addition in line with the existing dwelling to simplify construction and provide modest interior room sizes and floor plan configurations. While designing, our goal is always to keep the design and size compatible with precedents set by similar houses on Beresford and ensuring our floor space index is kept under one, even though various approvals of one to 1.25 FSI have already been approved in the neighborhood. We're increasing the soft landscaping in the front of the property from the current 2.8 square meters, which is about 8%, to nine square meters, which is 26%, basically a 220% increase to current uh, layout. However, we are so sure on that 75% requirement based on the, uh, the, the driveway and, and just, just the way the houses are located between 411 and 413. We have been working very closely with our arborists and urban forestry to mitigate the injury to the trees in adjacent park on the south side of the property. We went through various design changes to ensure our impact is mitigated to the rear trees and this is shown in our foundation layout to ensure our impact to the tree root system is at a minimum. Careful consideration has been given in our design process and the request relief in, in our minor variance application we feel is minor. The building fits in an ever evolving and dynamic neighborhood of Blue Rose Village, keeping with similar approvals and surrounding build forms. We spend considerable time to ensure our design does not set any precedents in the neighborhood and our minor variance requests are below recent approvals on Beresford Avenue and adjacent streets. I'd like to conclude and respectfully request the committee members to approve our minor variance application. And this is also supported by 11 reference letters that we received just 
uh, south of Ardog and north of Colbeck for our application. Thank you for your time. If anyone has any questions, I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you. Panel, any questions for the applicant at this stage? Let's move on then to the speakers that are standing by. Uh, Lisa, you've been unmuted. Hello, um, members of the committee. My name is Lisa Moore. I'm the next door neighbor at uh, 413 Beresford, directly north of 411 Beresford Avenue. We have lived here for over 30 years. I do agree that 411 Beresford needs to be renovated, but I do not support the application to 411 Beresford Avenue as a minor variance. I sent my letter of objection March 21st, so please refer to the details in that letter, as well as I emailed three different petitions from the neighbors opposing the minor variance applications. I'm not familiar with construction or the city bylaws, but reading the hearing notice, it seems like this house will take up most of the existing property, taking away most of the existing green space. Um, the houses that are south or north of uh, the park, um, they're, they're much smaller properties than they are north, um, which yes, there are bigger houses going uh, up north of Beresford. Um, I don't think the rear addition from 0.6 meters to 0.97 meters constitutes as a minor variance. Also, it does not respect the scale of the area. My backyard faces the large church on Runnymede, which is directly east of my property, which is a giant wall in my backyard. This, if this house is built, I will be surrounded by walls, not only east of me, but as well as south, which I know I will no longer be able to see the trees in the park. The proposed rear addition seems like it will impact the trees in the park. These should be protected as a priority over new development. The raised deck will be directly looking into my backyard. Why do they need a raised deck as well as a balcony in the backyard? I'm okay with the balcony in the front of the house, but do they really need two balconies and a deck that will take away my outdoor space, pleasure, that I've enjoyed for over 30 years. Also, the extension of the property out front is directly over top of their current parking pad. With two cars, where will they park? This is very limited park. There's very limited parking on my street. My worry is they will continue to park in our shared driveway. Uh, regarding variance number two from 0.9 meters to 35.35 meters south side lot, uh, line lot, I don't think it's appropriate to approve a building closer to the lot, the lot line of the park than what is provided in the existing zoning. Regarding variance three, from 75% to 26%, the amount of soft landscape front yard should be closer to 75% in order to help with the greening of the area. I ask that you review all the letters from the neighbors and consider refusing this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Panel members, any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Moderator, next speaker, please. Christine, you've been unmuted. Oh, oh, oh. sorry. Um, I'm just going to concur with a lot of what Lisa said. Um, my my comments would uh, basically mirror her comments, other yeah. than to express why. Christine, we're having a bit of a, an echo here. So if you could try to maybe, if you're listening through different devices, if you can try to mute one uh, of the two. 30 by 75. Uh, feet, and I'm surrounded on three sides Hello. by properties of similar size to 411. Um, as per Lisa's comments, the the uh, petitioner's um, precedent setting properties that he's pointing to are on lots south of us, which are 160 foot deep lots. They're quite substantially large for this neighborhood, in fact, for, for Bloor West Village as a, as a whole. Um, I'm concerned that this precedent will be set and when those houses around me change hands, we could see similar development go in and my house will be overwhelmed by three-story houses with virtually no yards and balconies overlooking me. So um, other than that, I support what Lisa said. I think this is not a minor variant situation. Um, the intensification of the house covering more than uh, Seventy-two percent more than it's allowed to cover, which is what the numbers um, state, and reducing the soft landscape by sixty-six percent of what it's supposed to be, um, and further increasing the height of the sod on the street by thirty-two percent, and removing the parking, um, the pad parking, and putting more burden on the street, and also removing the soft landscaping and um, forcing more water into the storm sewers. Um, I think that sort of sums it all up. 
I don't, as Lisa said, I don't disagree with these folks needing to do renovation on their home to make it more livable for them, but I just don't feel that this is the appropriate project for this particular property. Thank you very much. Hello, Christine. Can you please state your address? Hello, Christine. Yes. Yes. Please state your address. Oh, 425 Beresford Avenue. Thank you. I'm seven doors north of the proposed um, building site. Okay, let's ask the panel. Panel, any questions here for the speaker? Okay. Thank you. We'll go on. I believe there's another speaker standing by. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, actually the other speaker has left and I think he was listed in support. Very good, okay. All right, then in that case, we'll, go, we'll return to the agent who will have a chance to speak to the issues raised by these two speakers in rebuttal. Hi, uh, yeah, so, 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 the, so I can respond to a few things that were raised by Lisa and by uh, our neighbor on 425 Beersford. So we are not decreasing the soft landscaping in the, in the front. We're actually are increasing it because we're eliminating the path right now that we have that goes from our front door to the park. Uh, the reason why everyone is a little confused about that value is because the first, I think, uh, seven or eight feet of the property line, a lot of neighbors don't know this, is actually owned by the city. So even though we're increasing fully, uh, we're actually going from the current, almost it's a zero. It's, I literally, I just counted uh, a few of the, of, of the soft landscaping we have in front of the house and, and at the side, which basically have no paving. It's basically zero right now. We're actually, we're going to nine square meters. Uh, and the reason why that is, is because the first few feet of the, of the property is actually city owned. And we already been talking with urban forestry. There's a little tree there that's, it's in rough shape. Uh, and they already gave us instruction how to, to protect that tree and, and what to do to basically remove the, basically the interlock and replace it with soft landscaping. So even though it looks uh, uh, like we are reducing it, we're actually are increasing the soft landscape because we're eliminating fully the footpath that goes from the front door and basically around the fence so you can go into the park. So that's uh, one item. If you look, actually look at the survey, uh, you can actually see on the survey uh, that basically we don't have, like you, you see the little, like it's literally the, just a little tip of that circle is basically on our property line. Everything else is, uh, is basically paved all around, sides right to the, to the fence. So, so that's one thing. And, and another thing with regards to the petition that was signed, and I noticed there's some names, no addresses, and it was signed by various people. Uh, it was very deceiving and very inaccurate of what was stated on the, on the petition. It didn't actually use the zoning notice values of what our values were. They're just using generic, uh, and basically in three of the four uh, statements were actually incorrect when you actually analyze what the zoning notice specified and what, uh, what the actual values are. Uh, our house is not a thousand square feet more than allowed. It's actually only 900 based on FSI, and our FSI is only under one. Uh, we are now reducing our front yard green space by 66%. So that looks such a negative connotation. We're actually increasing it by 220%. Uh, the 32% value is correct because our side walls are 9.89 meters and over the seven and a half meter allowed. But again, we try to limit those walls on the current footprint of the house. So, so they're basically in the middle center line of the house. So none of the front or the rear will be affected by, by this wall. Um, and we and, and increase the maximum allowable height of the building to accommodate a full three-story. Again, that's an incorrect statement because we're doing a partial three-story uh, addition. Uh, the third-story addition is actually on the current footprint of the house, which is 26 by 20 feet. Again, we want to make sure that we're not overbuilding. We want to keep our FSI under one. Uh, we, we, we went through a lot of houses in the neighborhood. We actually went through a lot of houses in the last two years before we bought this house because initially our plan was to find a finished house that I can move in with my family because our daughter was starting uh, grade one last September, but we just couldn't find a house that basically met all of our criteria. Uh, and we basically settled with this one and knew eventually we would have to renovate. Um, so we took a lot of these things into consideration. Also the size, initially the house was only two stories. We went further to the back to the base to to, uh, the, to the rear setback, but again, after talking to urban forestry and the way the trees are located, we decided to make the sh house shorter, reduce the foundation, so we can avoid root systems, so we can completely reduce uh, and, and 
not completely reduce, but minimize uh, the routes as much as we could. So we do have various communication with urban forestry. We have an uh, exploratory excavation plan for, for April uh, to basically see how the routes look uh, uh, close to, to the new foundation, which is extended, but literally offset from the, from the main wall uh, to make sure that we're not touching the roots. And by making the house shorter, but going up in the middle, uh, we are, we're way below uh, the limitations of the rear setbacks, and we're also abiding by the front setbacks as well. So we took a lot of considerable considerations to, to design our house that doesn't set a precedent for the neighborhood, uh, but at the same time meets all of our criteria because we're planning to live for the next 15 years until our kids finish high school at a minimum. Uh, my wife now works from home, so one of the reasons why we did that third floor uh, is, 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 I'll is ask because, for your final comments now, please. Yeah, is because, uh, you know, how the work dynamics is, is changing and we, we basically need a home office that we can work from home. Anyways, so that's kind of completes my, uh, uh, rebuttal on, on the, on, on the uh, issues raised by, uh, in, in objection to, to our, to Thank our, you very our, much. Let's see if panel members have any questions to put to you directly. Panel? Ms. Hayes, go ahead. Hi, I'd like to uh, just, um, if you could just summarize um, the FSI being requested and, and whether that's prevalent in the immediate neighborhood as well as three stories. Yes, yeah, so our FSI is currently at 0.97 that we were requesting. No, uh, yes, but does that, is that, is that uh, characteristic of the neighborhood? Yes, if you go to our cover letter uh, that we, we submitted, mm -hmm. and at the, uh, basically on Appendix A, I kind of summarized a lot of the houses that have just been, just been built on bears, but I didn't even uh, go down all the other adjacent and parallel streets. Uh, and there's various approvals where you can, just recently, uh, 22 Bearsford was, uh, was, uh, uh, approved uh, and there's various uh, various FSI over one that were approved and when we were, when we were doing our design we wanted to make sure that we're below one so again we're not setting any precedent for, for the neighborhood so if you go to the cover letter um, there is um, there's, a, there's a little chart and overview of houses that have already been built on Bearsford or renovated on Bearsford mm -hmm. uh, you know a summary of FSIs can you tell us when the cover letter was submitted so we can put it on screen for the members because we can't Seem to find it. See it. It's uh, it's actually uh, it is on the website. Um, we go in the committee of adjustment and you click four eleven Bearsford. Hmm. It's in the top four. Just, yeah. we'll, we'll give staff a moment to see if we can pull that up. I, I just have the same question, but in a different way. Uh, when you put down 0.97 times in your site plan. Is that your own calculation, including the basement floor area? So it does include the basement, no, uh, because the basement is below the grade. Okay, so all of that 97 goes up above yep. grade. Okay. Yep. If I can share my screen, I can also show you the cover, uh, the cover light that we submitted. Is this it? Is that it? That, that's correct, that's it, yes. Yes, the previous pictures are just uh, houses like from uh, from bears for us, north and south of us. Some are just within a few hundred meters of us. So yes, could, could you leave it on that? Uh, on that, uh, yeah, leave it there, please. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions, panel? 
If there are none, then it's time to take the application into committee for a motion, uh, unless any of the panel members would like to make a comment in advance of that. Ms. Hayes, go ahead, please. Hey, this one is a, a bit of a challenge because um, the numbers in and of themselves, some um, seem quite large. Having said that, however, uh, I think that the, the design of the building and the setbacks at the front and the rear of the third floor and the massing and the fact that there's no length or depth variances with respect to this matter, the front yard landscaping is, is, is um, not a different circumstance than what currently exists and we've heard that it's an improvement. Um, I can support this application. Further comments by anyone? Mr. Salomon, go ahead. Yeah, I, I did have some concerns with the overall FSI just because it was hard to relate to the rest of the street to see whether it fits in. I think if we do approve this, I would like to add conditions that it be tied to the site plan and elevation drawings, which clearly show that the third floor is set back from the front and at the rear. And also there is a third floor rear balcony and at a condition that the there be privacy screening of minimum 1.5 meter on the north and south sides, I believe, of that third story rear balcony. That, well, listen, if you'd like to go ahead with that motion, go ahead, please. Um, Nimrod, sure. I was just saying, does the screening need to be on the south side because that's the side that goes to the park? You're, that's correct. So let's just do it on that one side, which is the north side then. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, so yeah, I would move approval of the variances um, subject to conditions that it be tied to the site plan and elevation drawings and that the there be 1.5 meter high privacy screening on the north side of the third story rear balcony. Thank you. There is a second to that. That is seconded by Ms. Hayes. So it is moved and seconded to approve with those conditions. Those in favor, show of hands, please. And the vote is unanimous to carry the motion. So the application is so approved. Thank you, panel. We move on to number 13. One hundred two Donlands Avenue. Before us are submitted materials. There's a revised site plan, floor plans, and elevations from March twenty-four. There's a zoning notice from the zoning examiner, Toronto Building, dated March twenty-four. Cover letter from the applicants from December. And presentation materials from the applicants from March. And in comment, we have um, email correspondence from community planning. So at this stage, we shall have the agent join us, please, by stating your name. Andrew, you've been unmuted. Maybe you can try to unmute yourself uh, on your own device. Hi, can you hear me? We do hear you. Go. You hear me? We hear you. State your name, please. Okay, great. Hi, it's Andrew Peel, um, applicant and uh, co-owner of 102 Donlands Avenue. Very good. And, uh, great. Okay. Um, Chair, could I just ask one question? Sure. Um, 
when they start, just in terms of having reviewed the material, am I correct that you are revising variance number three to be 1.23 FSI? Correct. And is there, do you have the square meters for that? Uh, yes, the floor area is, uh, revised floor is 157.6 square meters. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify that before we started. Thank you. Well, we're not going to be, um, would panel members like a presentation on this? Anybody like a presentation? Um, Mr. Selman, yes, would you? I, I did have questions. Go ahead. I, um, if the applicant can explain the FSI that's being proposed, and, and it it seems quite high, and so how, why is it at one, one? I think it's now one point three two, I believe, and and how does that fit with the area? Uh, sure, can if you can bring up the presentation uh, to, I think it's slide eleven. And uh, correction, the FSI revises 1.23. Just let me catch that um, it's, it's no longer 1.62? No, it's 1.23. 1 1.23. So I believe uh, slide 11 is uh as long as the numbering hasn't changed uh should be uh should be it there uh yeah, uh, oh, yeah there you go okay so a key thing so i, I had, did have a presentation but it seems like i won't have an opportunity to go through it we are proposing to retrofit this building to the passive building standard uh which requires substantial amounts of insulation uh, and uh, so we will be, we're proposing to add exterior insulation of a substantial thickness. Uh, and you can see I've highlighted in yellow or orange the, the amount of insulation we're putting around the building. And I've done this calculation to show if we didn't add this insulation, which is the usual thing to do, not to, to insulate the walls, uh, we would have an FSI of 1.10. So our FSI is actually 12% of it is due to this exterior insulation. Um, and naturally we're, you know, there's, there's key benefits to insulating it. You know, it uh, really drives down the carbon emissions. It aligns with the city policies around uh, the, you know, 2040 by zero, uh, zero carbon by 2040 target. Um, so um, I think we're, the, the way that things are, the FSI is accounted for, um, you know, kind of penalizes you for, doing the right thing by adding insulation. Okay, let's... So my just my question with the FSI is, um, wh what have you done to reduce the FSI from 1.6 down to 1.23? Like, what has changed? If you we go up to a couple of slides, uh, there was a mistake in the original drawings uh, that we had proposed to lower the basement because um, we are we're adding a suite down there, and so we wanted to ensure sufficient height. And in order to do that, we need to lower the slab. And by lowering the slab, that puts, um, that, that happens to also put the basement at a lower level, level that it can be excluded from the FSI calculation. And that's been confirmed in the revised zoning certificate. So the, the FSI goes down because the basement is no longer included. It was included in the 1.62. Yes, by, by mistake because of the the error in the basement level shown on the original drawings. Okay. And so how much actual new GFA is being uh, proposed, is being added? Sure, if you go to slide 13, I believe it is. Thirteen, please. Here's, uh, oh, no, sorry, 12. I missed, uh, Got the number there. Okay, so here's um, the existing, which is in the third column there, showing the FSI at 0.87. Uh, oh no, that excludes the attic. So there is actually an attic that is pitched um, front and back, and it actually extends almost halfway to the back of of the uh, the house. 
uh, except for by definition of FSI, how you calculate it, we can't really include it. It wouldn't, it's not included in the FSI. So it's actually built space there, but we, by the, the calculations, we, we have to exclude it. Um, and then um, uh, we, we had originally, I, I will note, we, on our initial design, we submitted for preliminary project review. Our FSI was 1.38, and that included a front and back extension. Uh, based on that feedback from the city, we actually revised the de design substantially, and uh, we've actually removed the back mudroom. So in the back, we're actually getting more backyard, and we're pushing uh, the, uh, it's only the third floor extension that is now be ex ex being extended to the back, uh, the rear wall, the second story, to, to align with the second story rear wall. Um, that's only where the space is being created. Let me ask you a question. Um, the, uh, the proposal is for a multi-suite rental. Specifically, how many units will the, uh, will, would the result, resulting proposal um, involve? There are three suites. It would be um, a, um, a basement unit, a ground floor unit, and then an uh, upper two-story unit. Thank you. Okay, and I know you did. did, you, did. You, Go ahead. Um, there was a an email from uh, the planning department speaking with respect to the initial FSI. Have Have you received any further comment from them with the adjustment? And also, does that, uh, can you point to any similar densities in the immediate neighbor area? Sure, yes. My, my last communication from the city um, uh, indicated that they would um, recommend uh, not to approve the application. Mm -hmm. um, there is on slide 16, if we could bring that up, I, I've given a, three examples of recently approved applications in the neighborhood. Um, that collectively speak to all of the variances we're uh, uh, applying for. And the first one, 92, speaks to that uh, it was actually recently approved for three suites. And um, uh, so that, that's been approved. So there's precedence in the neighborhood there. 84 what's Muriel. The, what's the FSI, though, on it? What's the FSI uh, on that one on Don Lambs? That one um, I didn't record. That would prob uh, probably guessing under one. Um, and then on 84 Muriel, uh, this is actually a new construction. They've put in two side-by-side -side semis. Uh, the FSI on each read is 1.34, so substantially larger. Thank you. And I, I know you, um, you have taken quite some uh, care here with respect to low carbon. Is it if you wanted to make a couple of comments about your initiative in that direction, go ahead, please. Uh, sure, yeah, there's opportunities. Basically, I mean, I don't know if you want to bring up the presentation, but I have a statistics from the uh, city of Toronto showing the greenhouse gas emissions from 2019, showing that 57% of those are attributed to buildings, and naturally our existing stock, which is poorly insulated, uh, would be a big, uh, you know, big portion of that uh, relative to new construction. Uh, and so it's, there's um, a clear um, uh, policy and a clear drive and clear need to substantially retrofit buildings in a way that um, achieves the, the city's targets. Um, and so, you know, we, we need to add substantial amounts of insulation at a substantial cost. So we're willing as homeowners to bear this cost. Uh, there are very few incentives that can actually support this. Um, and uh, yeah, as a result, I've gone over the impact on the the FSI. Okay. Um, yeah, very good. All right then. Any further questions, panel, for this applicant? I am hearing none. Let us then take the application into committee for a motion. Any comments first from anyone? with respect to the application. Mr. Salomon, go ahead. I still have concerns with the overall FSI that's being proposed. Um, uh, I don't believe it fits with the character of the area. I, I haven't seen enough evidence 
to indicate that that proposed FSI is something that is replicated, um, you know, in more than just a couple of uh, cases. Further thoughts? Ms. Hayes, go ahead. Although I applaud the the uh, efforts here, and I think the design has tried to um, um, be as sympathetic as possible to the area, I, I think it is too much for in the context of, of the lot and being a semi. As, so I can't support it in its current form. Right. As do I. I, I you know, the low carbon, the low carbon uh, initiative is very good, but if it's overbuilt, it's, it is still an issue. And uh, my, my sense is that it does represent overbuild. Any other comment? Uh, I don't have any further comment, yes. Mm -hmm. I the height and the FSI is at the back of the height, <clears throat> and the FSI is pretty huge. Very good. I'll let the panel for, that, for a motion in that case. Mr. Salomon, please proceed. Yes. So I would move refusal of the variances that are requested as, uh, as amended. Thank you. Second to that motion. It is seconded. So. Uh, moved and seconded to refuse the application as amended. Those in favor, show of hands, please. That motion is unanimous. The motion is carried. And the application as amended is refused. Panel moves on to item number 14. Which is 98 Dunlow. And on 98 Dunlow Road, panel has before us um, materials submitted. It's a cover letter from the agent, March 23. There's an arborist report from December. There's comment from transportation and from urban forestry. In support, there are three form letters signed by owners or occupants of 96, 100, Dunlow, and 17, Brownside. So with that, we shall ask the agent for 98 Dunlow to join us, please, by stating your name. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Galbraith. I'm a planner here on behalf of the application. Thank you very much. Okay. Panel members, any questions for the agent? Any requests for a presentation? Presentation, no. I'm not hearing any requests or any questions, so in that case we can take the application into committee for a motion, please. Ms. Hayes, go ahead. I just have one question, sir. Yes. Um, with respect to the soft landscaping, is it an aesthetics or a maintenance issue that you're looking to take out the little bit around the pool and the garage? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it largely is. Um, that area isn't growing very well because of, uh, uh, because of the pool. Um, it doesn't provide much in the way of uh, uh, functional landscaping. So are you it's largely in existing condition, if I may. So are, are you? I, I take it from the submissions. You're they're planning. There's a plan to redeck around the pool, and so they would. Yeah, read. That's exactly correct. Is there any ability to use permeable pavers when they? Yes, I think so. Redo, redo that. I, I I think there would be provided. I, I'm not a I'm not a pool guy, so yeah. I don't. There's I, certain, I, yeah, I don't know um, what the regulations are around that. Yeah, so. I'm not sure. I think. Um, I think if it can be, if that section can be done in permeable, um, uh, I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure they would have no problem doing it. I'm hesitant to make it a condition just because I don't, I don't know the answer to that. 
Are they putting? Are they going to put in any planter boxes or anything? It's pretty yes. austere uh, looking. Um, art yes. Yeah, so some. Some additional um, planter boxes are going to be added and it helps offset the reduction. That I believe is the existing condition. And then, there we go. Um, so uh, planter two planter boxes are going to be uh, added. Is the space under the deck soil or hardscape? The deck uh, it the is, it's It's not soil. So there's no drainage there? No, there isn't. Okay, thank you. And that's an existing condition. Mr. Salomon. Yeah, um, can the applicant just verify, is the existing FSI 0.52 and the size of the additional GFA, is that about 40 square meters? Uh, that sound the the existing FSI is 0.52 and the addition is 0 0.08 FSI, um, well below even the average. Uh, this will be the small the fifth smallest approved FSI in the area. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Hayes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that the FSI being requested is indeed minor. The height of the garage is um, simply a little bit at the peak and replacing the existing roof. So I don't think there's any additional impact there. The rear soft landscaping is marginal now. Um, I can appreciate the reasons why it's being reduced. I don't think that's gonna have much more additional impact um, but although it can't be a condition, I would uh, take the um, the submissions of the of the applicant's representative that they'll do their best to um, do permeable pavers where it's permitted. So I move a motion to approve the application um, with no conditions. Thank you very much. Is there a second? It is seconded, Mr. Chang. Moved and seconded to approve. Those in favor, show of hands, please. Unanimous vote, motion is carried, and the application is approved. Panel moves to the next item, 98 Whitehall Road. And on 98 Whitehall, the only materials before the panel are those submitted by the applicant. Let's have the applicant join us, please, by stating your name. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ben Domingos, architect, here representing the owners of 98 Whitehall. Thank you very much. <laughs> panel members, if you'd like a presentation, we can have one. Any <laughs> questions to the, to the uh, architect? No? I'm not hearing any questions or requests for presentation, so let's take the application into committee for a motion, please. Mr. Salomon, go ahead. I think the variances are minor in nature, and I would move approval of the variances with no conditions. Thank you. Second to that. It is seconded, Ms. Hayes. So moved and seconded to approve. Those in favor? Show of hands. Motion carried. The application is approved. Panel moves to number 16. Six zero eight Clinton Street. Applicant materials are before us. Plus we have a soft landscaping material from the applicant. March 23rd, and we have five form letters in support, 604, 606, 610, 612, and 624 Clinton Avenue. 
So let's ask the uh, agent to join us. Please state your name. Hello, my name is Tyler Walker, and I'm the applicant for 608 Clinton Street. Okay. Um, any questions here, panel, for the uh, for the agent? I know, I, I know, I, I have one. I'm going to ask staff to put up uh, drawing A004. Um, a zero 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 four. Yep. Yeah, zero zero four. It's uh, I believe it's a site plan. My question to you, agent, is going to be um, with respect to the rear soft landscaping. Your your deficiency at thirty um, thirty over fifty is is quite significant, and I'm wondering what is restricting you to uh, to that thirty. 30 level you know um, what what specifically and since I know that you cite other other properties that have deficient soft landscaping but I want to know what you know we, we deal with each application on its own merits what is preventing you from um, being compliant with the soft landscaping in the backyard well what we've done is essentially recreated the amount of soft landscaping that exists uh, at this moment. Um, the garage and the area behind the garage uh, takes up a substantial amount of the, of the rear yard. Um, and so what we've done is uh, consistent with what uh, currently exists. Um, to be honest, we weren't looking specifically at the number 30% and said this is what is exactly we need. What we did is we um, recreated what what is already there. Okay, so um, my concern with respect to that approach is this: um, soft landscaping has become a, a real focus because of um, its ability to assist with stormwater management, and uh, so. Um, as I look at your at your rear yard plan there, it strikes me that the proposed deck could be reduced in size, still be a good sized deck if it was reduced by even half, and that it would substantially improve the soft landscaping percentage, probably from 30 up to 40. Um, so, you know, the, the the goal here is here's an opportunity to to remediate. Um, and uh, strikes me the deck is too large, and the soft landscaping issue is is hurt in the process of making it that large. So your comment on that, please. Um, I mean, realistically, we would be open to reducing the size of the deck. Uh, again, we didn't um, we didn't think that this would be a, a, a sticking point, to be honest, because it's it, we're just essentially recreating the existing condition. Um, so we, we would, if that would be a requirement, um, we would be open to it. Uh, it surprises me a little bit that it is a bit of a sticking point, only in that um, community planning did not uh, bring this up. Um, and so this is a, a new point for me to hear. Well, it's an opportunity now, and you know the uh, the focus on on soft landscaping has sharpened. It's sharpened in the last uh, eighteen months, in fact. And um, to recreate a deficiency um, without thinking about it doesn't strike me as a as a smart way forward. Um, but that's just my question. Any other questions, panel, for the uh, for the applicant? No, I, I think that's a, a good point. And so really it's asking the applicant, what can they do in the rear yard to increase the amount of soft landscaping? Uh, I think they're showing on the rear yard a um, some paved walkway area at the rear. And I, I don't know, is that counted as part of the soft landscaping or not? 
uh, it is not considered soft landscaping. It's it's an existing walkway that we were retaining. And so, um, if you were to remove that walkway and leave the deck the way you're showing it, uh, how much of an increase in soft landscaping would that result? Would would that bring you into compliance? No, uh, it, it would not bring us into compliance. I, I don't know the exact number, to be honest, but it isn't, you know, 20% of the rear yard. The unfortunate part is that the garage and, and the area behind the garage uh, constitute a, a substantial percentage of the, of the rear yard as it exists. Yes, and that's what we're, that's what we're dealing with here. The, that is the fact. Um, so it gives you where, where then in, in that not being available, where else can we look for increased soft landscaping so as not to create a, or continue a deficiency that doesn't need to be there? Absolutely. I'm, I'm just pointing out that unfortunately, and, and we're open, so we could replace the path with uh, either green space entirely or permeable pavers. Um, unfortunately, it just won't push us up the, the 20 percentage points that we would like. But you're, you are currently, you are replacing the, the deck that's there now. So you, you're, you're not, um, you're rebuilding that deck. That is correct. So there, there is an opportunity and, and I, you know, I don't know the history of the property, but that deck may not have, you know, uh, had a permit or was, you know, the, I, I'm not arguing with you that it exists, but it's um, now has to be considered as part of the overall application. And, at, you know, it is to the chair's point, it it is quite a substantive deck and there, I think we're just asking, is there an opportunity to still meet the needs of your client with respect to the outdoor space? Because there is certainly still, um, other space other than the deck that might allow you to increase the soft landscaping. I mean, would a 12 foot deck be enough versus a 17 and, Absolutely. Seven and a half inches? So this is, I, I guess that's what, um, I mean, we can't, you know, we can't force you to make any adjustments. If you want us to consider it on the basis of what it is, that's, that's your call. But I think what the chair is simply asking is, um, given that that deck is, is not built and it is quite a substantial size and you're deficient and need a variance for the landscaping, is there something that you believe you could put before the committee now to improve that situation? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I would so, be happy to. But what would be, what would you be prepared to do? Realistically, it, it depends on what, you know, I, I if, if 12 feet would satisfy the, um, satisfy the committee, then we would be happy to make it 12 feet. Okay. I, I can't, I can't tell you what would satisfy. I'm just saying you, it's your homeowner. It's their needs. I'm not ask. I'm not telling you to adjust the application. I'm just saying, is there, do you believe you have any ability to, that would then adjust that variance? If not, we can deal with the application as it is before us. I can't tell you what would meet our approval. Um, well, that's unfortunately putting me in an awkward situation. I mean, to be honest, we would be happy to amend the deck. Um, you know, it's not a sticking point for my clients that it has to be the dimensions that it is. Um, and so we, we would be, you know, eager. We would be happy to amend the, the, the deck to reduce its size. Well, what, okay, I'll, the, the thought I had in mind is um, that we could, um, and the, and the uh, panel still has the, the opportunity to do this, um, the kind of thing that we could approach um, as a panel would be to change that soft, rear soft landscaping deficiency and move it up from 30 to 40, for example, and we, we could, uh, we could do that in our decision. Um, does the panel have any? But the, if the applicant wanted to do that, the applicant could do that now. Panel members, thoughts? 
Um, I I wouldn't feel comfortable amending a ver uh, making a decision on a variance not before us or altering that variance. Okay. But if the applicant wants to change it, I, that's up to them. But I'm also prepared to deal with the application as it is before us. Yes. Okay. So Very may I make an amendment? Is that is is that an option? If you're making it less onerous, yes, you can. Sure. Yes, I, I would happy to uh, amend it to uh, forty percent. Okay, that's coming from you. And your three, Mr. Chair, uh, what does that equate to in square meters? I'm going to let the applicant work that out. Applicant, yeah, we do need to have that figure also. Then what that would work out to in. Uh, okay, just one second, please. Uh, it would be uh, 46 square meters, as opposed to the 36.7 currently proposed. Thank you. Panel members, any further questions for the applicant? So we now have a, the, the application is now amended to, uh, to those numbers with respect to rear soft landscaping. At the applicant's request. So um, let's take the application into panel, into committee for a motion, please, unless there are further comments. Ms. Hayes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe on balance what's being requested and with the amendment um, to the rear soft landscaping is indeed minor. I think what's being proposed in terms of the addition to the home is actually a smart addition and is, is um, you know, not, I don't think increases the impact and I think it is not out of character with um, other built forms in the neighborhood. And so I have no issue supporting that. Uh, the uh, amendment proposed to the soft landscaping does, uh, does uh, I think, improve the situation. And um, that being said, I think I would like to, unless my colleagues have any further comment, I would move to approve the app, approve the application as amended with no conditions. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Mr. Salomon. So moved and seconded to approve the application as amended. Those in favor, show of hands, please. And that's a unanimous vote to carry the motion and to approve the application as amended. With that, panel moves along to item number 17. Item number 17 is 67 Pine Crescent. On 67 Pine, the committee has before it submitted materials, a contact summary of neighboring properties from the applicant. There is support correspondence from 73 Pine. And there are eight form letters in support from owners and occupants of 49, 59, 62, 67, 68, 71, and 82 Pine. So let us have the agent join us, please, by stating your name. Hi, my name is Mike Oliveira. I'm here representing 67 Pine Crescent and with replacement design located at 911 Davenport Road. Good afternoon, panel. Thank you very much. Okay. Panel members on this application, any questions, any desire for a uh, presentation? If there are none, we can take the application into committee for a motion, please. Mr. Salomon. Yeah, I'd like to move a mo motion. Uh, to approve the requested variances, I believe they are minor in nature, and uh, there are no conditions. And that is seconded by Ms. Hayes. 
So moved and seconded. To approve, those in favor, show of hands, please. Motion carried, and the application is approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we move along to number 18, which is 106 Richview Avenue, North Lot. And on this application before us are application materials submitted by the applicant, an arborist report, presentation material from the agent, staff report from Urban Forestry, two form letters in support, 106 Richview, 325 Richview. That is from, pardon me, from 106 Richview, the south lot. And there's opposition in the form of uh, written correspondence from 102 Richview. Okay. So we shall ask the agent to join us, please, by stating your name. Uh, good afternoon, sir. It's Mr. Bronskill, B-R-O-N. S-K-I-L-L, -L, first initial D for David. And just in terms of the address, sir, as I always uh, joke in pre-pandemic pandemic times, it was 333 Bay Street, Suite 3400 in Toronto. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, on this application panel, anyone care for a presentation? Ms. Hayes, is there a presentation? No, I just have uh, some questions if... if Carry on. Okay. So um, when I got to this on the agenda, I went, why does this address look familiar? Because we dealt with the other one a couple of weeks ago. And, and Ms. Hayes, if I can interrupt quickly, I was not, I, when I was in front of this panel last time, I'd indicated I was not retained on the North parcel. That was true. Mm -hmm. I was called about a week no, after. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not yeah, doubting I, you. I just thought. No, I, I just wanted to make that clear to the panel because I had said that last time and then famous last words here I am yeah here you are okay um, have you given the objection letter that was submitted back in February initially with respect to the south lot has there been any conversations with those individuals at all with respect to this proposal uh, we didn't I don't see that we got fresh for lack of a better word fresh letters of objection but has there been any outreach there at all I can advise you, Madam Chair, I don't know that there's been a direct conversation. Um, the, the good news is the south lot was not appealed and the owner of that lot, the applicant there, did have some discussions subsequent to the committee with those owners that, that as you know, are, are to the rear in, in that somewhat interesting and probably unique lotting pattern. I'm going to ask you to stop just for a moment. Staff, would you put yes. up the, the site plan, please? Because it is an unusual, an unusual site plan. So let's put up the site plan so we've got it to refer to. And it and at the risk of leading staff, the the location map might be helpful, Mr. Chair, in Fine. terms of just understanding. Mm -hmm. Not not necessarily the site plan. Let's go for the location map then. Yeah, that's helpful there. So so it was 102 and 104. And what's interesting is there's there's a driveway access from Richview that goes from the south lot north of 100 Richview that accesses those homes at the rear. Um, and, and you recall that there had been some concerns from those owners with the south lot. And I'm pleased to report that the owner of the south lot had conversations with them subsequently, and there was no appeal filed in respect of the south lot, um, which I think has helped address some of the concerns. This one's a bit further north. It doesn't have the same rear-to-rear -rear relationship uh, there as 102 and 104, in particular the objection letter you've got on file from 102. It also has a driveway out to Richview and um, isn't adjacent to that um, private laneway that had been part of the issues raised before you when we were here mm -hmm. last time. So in some respects, this is 
it, it is a bit of a cleaner lot, if I can say it that way, in terms of the relationships that it has to 102 and 104. Um, if you could just, what is the depth and length at grade? Uh, let me I mean, just the pull. variances are really related to the um, basement level. Am I correct with respect to the length and depth? And that at grade, do you comply? At grade, I'm just pulling up um, through Mr. Chair. From the front of the garage to the rear wall is 16.99 meters, but there is a projecting breakfast nook of about 2.9 meters. So, so at grade, it's it is a little bit more. It would be um, if I just do my math, 19. Uh, point uh, nine five meters to the back of that one story breakfast nook and then when you come up at the second floor it's 16.99 meters with the exception of something I'm seeing all the time on these houses a small projection where the bathtub would go um, and then the third floor is obviously um, considerably smaller in terms of its length or depth but so so the numbers themselves um, do relate largely to some of the excavation uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how they're measured. Um, uh, back under the outdoor room, you are correct, but but I did need to point out to you that there is that breakfast nook that does bring the ground floor over the 17 meters. So if the committee were inclined to approve this, would you have any concern about it being tied to plans? Through you, Mr. Chair, no, not at all. Um, it's it, it. There's no planning report here. They don't have concerns. That might be the type of condition they would recommend. I, as I've said to you before, on the south lot and on any on on any file when we've got these length and depth below grade, it's a reasonable condition to seek on something like this, and we would not oppose it. It it we would accept it. In fact. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Panel, further questions? In that case, we can take the application into committee for a motion, please. Ms. Hayes. Ms. Hayes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would be prepared to support the application. I don't believe the variance is being requested in the context of um, other built forms and other length and depth variances below grade are not unprecedented. I don't think the FSI is is um, is not troublesome to me, nor is the height. And I would be prepared to move a motion to approve the application, tying it to plans and also uh, forestry condition number one. Thank you. Does that motion have a second? It is seconded by Mr. Solomon. So moved and seconded to approve with those conditions. Those in favor, show of hands, please. Unanimous vote. Motion is carried. The application is so approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On item number 19, 119 Jones. The panel has before it material submitted with the application, plus 12 form letters in support. These are signed by owners and occupants of 98K Curzon, 102, 103, 104, 105, 110 and 11, 17, 121, 123, 125, 129 Jones received. Um, before or on March 21. So let's have the uh, agent here join us, please. Hello again. My name is Mike Dealer. I'm with Replacement Design located at 911 Davenport Road, and I'm here representing 119 Jones Avenue. Thank you very much. Just stand by a moment while I check with the moderator. Moderator, we have someone shown as, stand, as um, registered in interest. On number 19, this is yeah, not... Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, we that person is not in the attendance. Is not in attendance, okay. So there is no one registered to speak on this application. Panel members, um, questions or a presentation request? In that case, we can take the application into 
Committee for a motion, please. Mr. Salomon, go ahead. Yeah, I believe that the uh, variances are minor in nature. Uh, I note that the uh, soft landscaping front and rear are existing conditions. Um, so I'm going to move approval of the variances with no conditions. Thank you. Second. It is seconded, Ms. Hayes. Moved and seconded. Approval. Those in favor, show of hands, please. And the motion is carried unanimous vote. Thank you very much. The application is so approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And number 20 is the final application on this morning's agenda for 217 Bain Avenue. On this application, we have before us submission materials, revised drawings, March 17, revised zoning waiver, March 17, uh, cover letter from the agent, March 17. Planning rationale from the agent, same date. Presentation materials from the applicant, March 29. Commenting reports, we have community planning and urban forestry. There is both support and opposition correspondence. In support, from 215 Bain, from 219 Bain. There's a six signature petition from owners of 211, 213, 214, 218, 221, and 223 Bain. In opposition, from 197 Bain, from 215 Bain Avenue. And that is also from Chris Trevelyan so the, his, uh, his letter in opposition is dated March 23. His letter in support is dated March 28. In opposition, there's also correspondence from 219 Bain, Bain Avenue. Okay. Let us then have the Agent, join us. Good afternoon, Chairman and Madam Chair of the Committee. Um, can you hear me? We do hear you. State your name, please. Uh, my name is Vinny Lousão. I'm the designer and owner's agent for the requested minor variances. Very good. Thank you. Panel members, any request here for presentation? Any questions for the agent? Ms. Hayes. I just wanted to confirm after reviewing the supplementary material we got yesterday that you are removing variant request for variance number three because you now uh, will meet the bylaw requirements for the soft landscaping. Am I correct in my reading of that? That is correct, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Not hearing any, so we can take the application then into uh, into panel and into committee for a motion, please. Ms. Hayes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, with the elimination of uh, the variance with respect to soft landscaping, um, the depth variance, the depth is similar to the depth of 215. The existing FSI is 69.85. So I think the variance in request with respect to FSI increase and um, the depth are, are, I believe, are minor and appropriate and are not out of character. And I would move to approve the amended application subject to forestry condition number two. Subject to forestry number two, very good. Second to that motion. 
It is seconded, Mr. Chang. Moved and seconded to approve, subject to forestry. Those in favor, show of hands, please. And that is a unanimous vote. So the motion's carried. The application is approved, subject to forestry. And with that, the panel concludes its morning uh, agenda. And we are now at 1.30 p.m. Um, we shall resume panel. Can we resume at uh, 2.15? How would that be with the panel members? 2.15 work? Staff, are you okay with 2.15? Okay. Through you, Mr. Chair, staff is okay with uh, 2.15. Very good. <laughs> Okay, then, we are in recess then until 2.15 when we'll begin the afternoon agenda. Thank you very much, everybody.